All right, good evening, people. Um, just real quick, can somebody send a message? Make sure you hear me. I'm trying something new on my computer, so I'm hoping it's working. All right, good deal. Thanks, Megan. I appreciate it. All right, so guys, listen, I'm going to try to show the slides and then I'm going to turn on my camera and we're going to do, and don't run when I turn the camera on, guys. I'm sorry. I, that worked, so I try not to shave as much as I should. All right, so I'm going to show you some things when we go over, you know, the airway. Now, guys, all y'all understand airway management is pretty big, so it's not as big as patient assessment, but uh, I hope I'm not going to bore you tonight. So as it was pointed out earlier, y'all, are on chapter 10, not 11. Trust me, it's on my end on the instructor side when you try to look for the, the correct slide and you can't find it because it's the wrong one. All right, so let's get this going. Maybe. All right. So, so this is what the national standard says that we have to cover, all right? So it applies the fundamental depth and fundamental breathing of upper airway anatomy and physiology to a patient assessment and management in order to assure a patient airway, adequate mechanical, mechanical ventilation, and respiratory for all patients of, of all ages. Sorry. So this is the things that we have to touch. I just wanted to make sure I can go over this so you all know throughout the night we're going to be touching based on all of these. All right. So we're going to do over airway anatomy the assessment and techniques of assuring a, uh, of a patient's airway. We're going to go back and forth about um, a little bit of peds. Y'all are going to cover that real big in the pediatrics. But just to let y'all know, we're going to kind of dabble into that, not a whole bunch. All right. So I'm trying to click on a couple of screens because I'm, I'm cheating. I'm using my work screen so I can uh, also look at different notes. All right, again, so respiratory, uh, anatomy of the respiratory system, physiology and pathology pathophysiology of respirations, pulmonary ventilation, and oxygenation. We're going to go over the respiratory, respiration, external, anterior, and cellular. Assessment and management of adequate and inadequate respiration and wh why we use supplemental oxygen therapy. Artificial ventilations, uh, we're going to go over artificial, minute ventilation, alveolar, ventilation, effective artificial ventilation on a cardiac output. So y'all will kind of get the ideas of where it breaks down, how, why we need full of oxygen to go from the nose or mouth to the lungs, to the capillaries, to all these different parts. And it helps us going through the whole process. So it applies comprehensive knowledge of the pathophysiology of respiratory and perfusion to a patient and management. How are we going to manage the patient's airway? Um, are we going to control the airway? Do we need to be aggressive or do we need to let the patient be aggressive on their own airway on what we need to do? So some important steps in caring for any patient. We're going to obtain and maintain a patient's airway, like we just said. Ensuring a patient is breathing. And is it adequate? I mean, are they going to support life? You know, I'm addicted to breathing, so I want to stay breathing and I want to keep the patient's breathing as the best as possible. So that being an issue. So oxygen reaches body tissues and cells through breathing and circulation, which we all have an idea of that. All right, so, hang on, I gotta change one more. All right, so here's our anatomy review. All right, so the, the nasal pharynx, we know uh, that's kind of the back of the nose. Just so y'all kind of idea, since it's a top, big topic, um, y'all can't see my mouse, can you? Can anybody see my mouse on there? Okay, so right in here, that's where your, your COVID test is going back to. So that's the reason why you always feel that warm and fuzzy feeling. Guys, I get tested every four weeks. So I'm a recent COVID, second time COVID positive. And so I'm, I'm used to this. It sucks. But that's where they're trying to reach back into there to get your, um, your COVID test. Um, so if I was you, I would pay attention to this slide. Make sure you know. Hey, guess y'all know we got big dog out here working tonight too. So y'all will know the difference between your upper airway and it breaks down into here's and your lower airway. So those are very important when we talk about we have to ventilate the alveoli. This is what this is right in here. We need to know these. Why is it important to get from air from here all the way down to these? 
because that's how we move air throughout the body. All right, so the base of the lungs, the diaphragm, you know, uh, there's certain parts of the spine that keeps the diaphragm alive. That's going to be important in time for you guys to learn that too. Um, so that's an important picture. So y'all may want to try to look at that one kind of hard when y'all are studying for this test. All right, so major functions of the upper, upper airway. So tell me what part of the airway um, warms the air? Can anybody guess? While we're waiting on that one. So the major functions of the airway is to warm and filter and humidify air brought into the body. All right, so the pharynx is com compromised of the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the la laryngeopharynx. Ooh, got me tonight. All right, so this is a very big important part too. You know, we all talk about the little hangy thingy down that we want to be able to see when we go to, you know, your paramedics talk about, can I see it hanging? Um, parts of your tongue, your, your uvula. These are big anatomy parts of the upper airway. Want to make sure you know this. So it breaks down over here. What is part of your larynx, oropharynx, and your nasopharynx? Some test questions may come out of that. I'm gonna, if you can hear me knocking on my desk, that's kind of important. You may want to have an idea what pieces of the anatomy is in each area, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the laryngeopharynx. So those are import, important in my books is what I kind of always see. Those are those are going to come up in, in harder and in later times. Let me put it that way. All right. So the nasopharynx is born is formed by the union of the facial bones divided by the septum. Um, it's a, the cilia helps move contaminants out of the body. The terminites uh, increase the surface of the uh, nasomucinous. Sinus or cavities are formed by the cranial bones. Of course, that's, you know, reason why when you have sinus issues and sinus drainage, you taste it. It gets in the back of your throat. You start having a red, the scratchy throat is because of that. It's got to go somewhere. It's got to drain. It'll go into your, your GI tract. Fractures of certain sinus bones may cause a large leak of uh, CSF fluid. That's the zero of the, into the nasal passage. Sorry, I got caught up on reading another email that popped up of the nasal passages and the uh, auditory canal. This tissue of the nasal fairness are extremely delicate and highly vascular. So you're going to bleed. If you have any kind of facial injury or let's say uh, GSW to the face, you're going to have a lot of blood. It's very little blood. Uh, it's very little vessels and in, in blood capillaries, but you're going to bleed a lot. So that's something you got to think about and be prepared to be aggressive on an airway that you may have a GSW to the face or any kind of trauma. It's gonna it's gonna hurt and you're gonna have a lot of blood everywhere so you know keep your suction ready um, have you how that ready some four by fours you know you don't want to pack the airway because obviously you need to breathe but have that stuff handy if you know that just what you're going to is to a GSW to the potential to the face get out of the truck with your suction don't just leave it behind all right so the oral pharynx, like we talked about, is posterior to the oral cavity, the epiglottis. We always know about that because that's what swells. Everybody talks about that. Um, so it's the leaf shaped and uh, it's flap located at the base of the tongue, just above the larynx. Um, let's see. So here we start talking about the larynx itself. It's formed by many independent uh, structures. Uh, the main laryngeal structure is the thyroid cartridge cartilage. Uh, it's the nearest portion of the adult. It's right here. Um, so guys, pay attention to this too, because everybody, if you look up, it's kind of where you can kind of feel your little membranes going down to your throat, kind of look up in the air. You'll, on the guys, feel your Adam's apple. You can kind of feel this little opening right in here. That's important too. That's where we can kind of do a, uh, a cut down, put a little array. That's if we have some facial issues. So that's more of a paramedic higher level than that. But just so you know where you're the, the, all these little the structures of the anatomies are. Let's see here. All right. So functions of the airway is to exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide, which we all know that, which we always have to have oxygen. Does anybody know 
what percent of oxygen is in the air that we breathe on a day-to-day -day basis? Somebody want to take a guess at that one? That's right, 21%. Out of that 21%, Victoria, how much are we going to breathe into the body? And our body uses out of that 21%. How about that? Do you want to guess? Uh, close. Keep going higher. So let's do it. I'm going to cheat you guys. I'm going to put it down here if I can get my box to type. So it's 16%. We're going to use 16% out of that 21%, and our body's going to absorb that. We're going to breathe out the other percentage because we don't need it because our body can't absorb it anymore. So, so external boundaries are the four uh, cervical and vertebra and the xiphoid process, which you can – got to close out this so I can show you all on the screen. Um, it's coming up in a second. So the trachea is the conduct for the airway entry into the lungs. It divides at the – level of the cornea and it is right here all right so see where it starts to divide right here to your right main right mainstream and your left mainstream so that's when you and like in a paramedic intubates and you're only seeing one side of the airway the the chest rise and fall and they're only here in one um most time you're going to go into the right side if the paramedic intubates and it's too far you're only going to see this right side over here start inflating and they're going to only hear breath sounds on over here Sometimes you may hear them, hey, I got to pull back a little bit. And they're like, okay, hold it right here. Well, just to kind of help you guys out also so they know you know what they're looking at, look at the numbers that's listed on those tubes. And I don't know if y'all know about, you know, the tubes and anything like that, the different sizes. And that's okay if you don't because it's not your job. You just need to kind of familiarize yourself where the things are in your truck, in your bag, and anything like that. So you have yolas right here, your main bronchi, your smaller bronchi, it breaks it down from the big stems to the little stems, and then your bronchioles are down into here. And so that's the reason why that's your main structures of your air of your lower airway right there. I'm gonna click back over here on the question so I can hear a pension. Um let's see here. So each bronchius is divided into the smaller bronchi, then the bronchioles. So the bronchioles branch into the alveolar duct. So the alveolar serves as a functional site for the exchange of oxygen carbon dioxide. So we got to breathe it in. That's the reason why you'll hear people that are having respiratory trouble or panic attacks. They'll breathe into a bag because that creates the pressure and the exchange. Yes, you're bringing in carbon dioxide again, but it's not. It's not just a short period of time that you're going to do it. You're okay. You're not going to mess that up. All right. So here's where your oxygen goes in through the, the lining of the alveolus into the pulmonary capillaries. So we got to have good ventilation and positive ventilation to go in there. Sometimes room air is not going to help them. You'll have to put them on some type of uh, supplemental oxygen, which will help out in the case. Surfactants line the alveola, decreases surface tension, and to go into the surfactant. So that's the reason why they don't like taking white males early before, like, was it 37, 36 weeks of pregnancy? Um, because they don't have enough surfactant in their lungs to keep their lungs inflated. So that's the reason why they'll push white females to tab their babies longer than it is to, uh, to a, like, a black female that has a little boy versus a white little boy. It's, it's all crazy. I don't understand all that, but I do know it's due to the surfactant level. All right. So let's break it down right here and look. So your trachea comes in, here comes your air, and it's gonna break into the right main stem, uh, right here, right main stem to your left main stem. Then you got your bronchiolas, your aortas right here in the center. So when you're doing chest compressions, you gotta think, are you creating too much pressure on the lungs? We just need the pumping of the heart, guys. Don't worry about all that. Here's your supervena cava, where'd my mouse go? Right there. So there's another, how the body's starting to stack itself. Um, between the lungs is the mediastinum, surrounded by the tough connective tissue. The phrenic nerve inverts the diaphragm, diaphragmic muscles, allowing it to contract. So without our diaphragm, we're not, whew, I don't know if you heard that, that was kind of loud. So without the diaphragm, it's not the muscle that's gonna allow us to breathe into our lungs. So this contracts, it helps our lungs have space. 
Uh, let's see. All right. So the respiratory and cardiovascular systems, they have to work together. You got to breathe. You got to have your heart pumping to be able to survive, you know, to be able to have function of life. So it ensures a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients to the body of us. Uh, ensures carbon dioxide exchange and the waste products are moved from from every cell into the body because we it got to dump it it's got to go somewhere the body can't keep it and that's the reason why you exhale you use the restroom you pass all this stuff it's because it's got to have functionality with each other so this one right here is real critical i'm gonna leave this up for just a second and let y'all look at this so sufficient external ventilation and perfusion are required to deliver adequate oxygen so when you're going to a cardiac arrest, you know, they always say you got to get there quick, got to get there safe. But here's why. So for each minute that you're down, look at this from zero to four. Brain damage may not or brain damage is not likely. Now four to six brain damage possible is because we're missing the oxygen. The oxygen is not there because the brain feeds off of it. So six to ten minutes, that's brain damage likely. So you think of a rural area that you may be responding to, it's going to take you 15, 20 minutes to get out there. Well, this right here does, well, where, where are we? So we're going to potentially have brain damage. That's the reason why we want to start CPR fast and effective and get it going. Because here's our clock. So you see right here, this just helps you understand why it's important to get some respirations into them, good ventilations. You got to have that bag valve mask handy you get off the truck with o2 in your hand because of this clock right here because we're trying to prevent that um the brain damage we need to put air back into the brain all right so we all know the process of moving air in and out of lungs we've we've been alive for quite a while we understand that so inhalation fills our lungs we're breathing in air Sometimes it may not be the cleanest air, but that's what our nose hairs do. They kind of help filter that out. As it goes down, it, it helps try to get out their particulates. So the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract. And if you'll ever notice, like on kids, you'll see the barrel chest if they're having trouble breathing. Or you'll definitely see it on kids if they're having respiratory, very, very much respiratory compromise. They'll have the seesaw effect. So this is inhalation. We know we all have to do that. All right, so back again, it's the diaphragm is a specialized skeletal muscle, and it functions as both as a voluntary in and a involuntary muscle, and we're going to tell you why in just a second. It's pretty cool how that diaphragm works, so that's, it pretty amazes me. So the partial pressure is amount of gas in a air or dissolved in fluid. Guys, I haven't seen your test before. I have no idea, and I really don't want to know what your tests are, but if it was me, I would probably know this right here. I would know the partial pressure is the amount of gas and air are dissolved in fluid. That just sounds important to me. Not only does you need to know that, but it sounds like a test question in my book. So you have inspiration of uh, focused on delivery of oxygen in the alveoli and the variations of tidal waves and volume, respiratory rate, or both will affect the minute volume. That's pretty deep. And I'm not sure if we're going to go into the tidal wave and the minute volume, but we'll see because I looked at this earlier, but I didn't pay a whole lot of attention when I was trying to flip through slides. So you see right here where it says the diaphragm contracts. So what we think about is the diaphragm contracts. And normally when you hear contract, it's like the muscles tightening up. But as you see right here, it contracts going down. So that allows the lungs to expand. Once the lungs expand, take in the air. And then the diaphragm relaxes, so it's it's going up now. And what that's creating is your lungs to uh, collapse. So you think about that, the contraction relaxes. It's very different than what we're used to, but that's the process. The balloon on the side is a very good illustration to kind of let you understand it. See how it gets big here for you to take deep breaths. And then when you exhale, the diaphragm relaxes kind of gives you a little I'm a picture kind of guy so I think that was kind of important for you to be able to get what they were meaning by that all right so exhalation this is what blows my mind right here so it doesn't require any muscular effort 
Anybody want to guess why? Well, since the answer is right here, I'm just going to let y'all guess it, though. So on relaxation of the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles increases in the intrapulmonary pressure. So what it does is, like we said on the balloon, it's creating pressure. So now you got to exhale. So the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles relax and the air is exhaled forcefully. Well, some of us breathe a lot faster and harder than others. I can tell you, we have six flights of stairs out here. Sometimes, some days I'm like, man, where's that O2 bottle? I may be getting old, but whew, it gets rough. So you see the flow of oxygen right here in the nose, down, and then we can breathe either in or out of the mouth. So the reason why they're showing mouth is a lot of people, you know, kids, mouth breathers when they start having when they're born. So think about that, too. So that could change up in your patho right there of the breathing through the mouth. And sometimes you'll see us do that, too. If we have a sinus infection or anything like that, we'll breathe. We'll be mouth breathers also. All right. Regulation of ventilation uh, involves a complex series of receptors, feedback loops. It's a constant thing that we don't have to think about. Our brain automatically does it for us. So think about if you had to when you're sleeping. And you had to think about breathing. How much sleep do you think you would actually get? Well, again, like I told you a while ago, I'm kind of addicted to breathing. That's really the only thing I'm addicted to. So it ought to be like, I got to sleep with one eye open so I can make sure I breathe. Um, so it drives the breath. This is based on the pH changes in the blood and the CSF. So when the oxygen levels rise, respiratory center suspends respiration until the rising carbon dioxide. And they stimulate this uh, respiratory center. Man, it's pretty cool when you think about that you don't have to do anything and you breathe. That's to me, that's uh, that's pretty neat how awesome our brains work. That just tells our body, hey, man, time to breathe. Take a deep breath. Oh, look, you're out. You're a little low in breath. You need to breathe a little bit faster. So to me, that is really cool uh, that our, our bodies just do that for us. Let's see. All right. So right there, sorry, uh, ad adequate oxygenation is required for internal respiration to take place and the process of loading oxygen molecules into hemoglobin molecules in the bloodstream. So the hemoglobin part right there, if y'all kind of, when you talk about your pulse ox and you want to put them on the, see what their O2 sats are, not O2 stats, that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. So it's, you want to see what their O2 saturation is. You're trying to, you're looking at the oxygen that's in the hemoglobin, either by the finger by the ear, the forehead, the toe, it, that's what you're looking for, is how much oxygen is attached to that hemoglobin. That right there will tell you a lot when you're looking at it. If, if you're looking at an O2 sat and it's low, hey man, give them some more O2, pump them up. All right, so metabolism. Cells take energy from the nutrients through a series of chemical processes. Each cell combines nutrients and oxygen and produces energy and waste. Now we're getting down into like the A and P part of this, the A and P part of producing energy and how they uh, create the sugars and all that stuff. So it's it's pretty neat when you break it down and you get further into this, y'all. I, I hope y'all continue and going into paramedic school because A and P just in itself teaches you a whole lot of stuff. So right there, it shows the process of exchanging oxygen, carbon dioxide occurs by diffusion. I mean, it's kind of like an atom bomb. You know, they create all these little, you know, atoms and particulates, and then they start creating, heat, you know, heat. Obviously, I never made it that far in school. We're just going to stick to paramedic school, though. So, all right. So, look over here. You talk about your pulmonary and your your alveolis and your capillaries and your pulmonary veins. They, they all interact with each other. And then your O2 goes out and your CO2 goes in, your alveolis and your capillaries. Man, that is just freaking cool. And again, you don't have to think about it. It automatically does it. The brain tells your body to automatically breathe. So the external perspiration is a process of breathing fresh in, air into the system. And again, right there, I said, well, I'll go. The hemoglobin picks up the fresh O2 as it is a crossover the alveolar membrane. That right there is it's, it's how you get your percentage on your O2 sats. Just remember that, your hemoglobins. All right. Break it down again to your internal. Gets a little bit deeper on us now. 
So your blood cells up here. Then you have your capillary on the outside. The oxygen and the nutrition, so on the, you know, and then the carbon dioxide and the waste out. See how it's moving in, the waste is coming out, going through your blood cells. That's how the exchange of good stuff and bad stuff come through the body. I don't know, I'll read the slide, but that's really how it works. So, let's see. Aerobic and anaerobic uh, occurs in the presence of oxygen, uh, the energy in the form of ATP. Can anybody tell me what ATP is? Y'all Google that real quick because I know somebody's trying to Google it for me. What is ATP? See, Victoria, you are pretty good at Googling, huh? So it's it's an energy-carrying molecule found in the cells of a living things. ATP captures chemical energy obtained from the breakdown of food molecules and releases it into the fuel of other cellular process. Hey, so think about that. That's the same way you got to feed it. You got to feed the respiratory system like the body takes the food and breaks it down into sugars and, and goes into that. Uh, I'm just picking on you. I'm pretty sure you knew that. ATPs, we learn it in some part of time. I know you learned it for your first time you went through EMT school. So anaerobic occurs when oxygen is not present and it can meet the metabolic demands of a cell. So it it's anaerobic does it without anything in there. So it'll take care of everything else. Uh, glycosis is a result of less the ATB production. Um, Let's see, adequate levels of perfusion and external ventilation must be present for the aerobic internal respirations. All right, so the neural controls, the primary control comes from the medulla and the pons, medullary respir respiratory centers, uh, the control rate, depth, and rhythm of breathing. Uh, trying to click over and make sure I had to click off y'all's chat for a second. Sorry, I was making sure I read it. So, is the mnemonic center has influence on the respiratory system and the and the inspiratory. So, y'all, this like I told y'all, it goes super deep. And then in times of increased demand, the mnemonic center decreases its influence. Because the brain is telling everything to situate, it's got to go, you got to breathe faster, you got to breathe off some O2. When you start having panic attacks, it's the same thing. It affects the respiratory system. So you breathe faster, but you're not going to breathe adequate enough. So that's part of it. All right, so the chemical stimuli. So the chemoreceptors, it's affect respiratory rate and the depth. So you have a constant monitor of the chemical composition of the body and the fluids. Um, Let's see, the central chemoreceptors monitor the pH of the CSF. Let me see what else I can read off my other notes over here. Is when serum carbon dioxide or hydrogen ion levels increase, the chemoreceptors stimulate the dorsal and the ventral respiratory groups and the medulla to increase the respiratory rate. Somebody want to tell me what that breakdown is? At least one of y'all. Nobody wants to guess on that one. All right, I'll give you another one. I, I, I understand, Victoria. It is pretty hard. I get it. I know you're not sure. It's deep. I'm telling you all, this is, you got to learn a little bit of the deep part to start getting in the cool parts. Um, so the chemoreceptors also are located in the aortic arch, and the cricoid bodies are also respond to the decrease in the PAO. To that, so the backup of the primary control of ventilation. I'm gonna skip. We're gonna go forward because that's a lot, y'all. We're getting deep. We're getting really deep. All right. So the dorsal respiratory group is reversible, uh, responsible. Sorry, responsible for internalization of a inspiratory. Ventral respiratory group is responsible for motor control, 
and inspiratory and expiratory muscles. So it's got to be responsible. All these little groups are, you know, the subcategories, man. They're teaching us all different things. Um, disruption of the pulmonary ventilation, oxygenation, and respiratory will cause immediate effects on the body. Somebody tell me what a, an interruption could possibly be. So if we're going to disrupt this pulmonary ventilation, what is an effect that we may see? Look, she's reading on the screen. All right, so hypoxia, good deal. So hypoxia is less sensitive and powerful in, than the carbon dioxide sensors in the brain stem. It's typically found in the end stage of COPD. Uh, COPD. Um, so tissues and cells do not get enough oxygen. You start, you start getting really short of breath. You become short of oxygen. So hypoxia is seen a lot. It just depends on where you are and if you get it early. So here's early signs of it. So you get restlessness, you're irritable, your tachycardia, your, your anxiety is going up because you realize you're having trouble breathing, that you just can't, you know, I don't know what's going on. I'm starting to freak out. Your heart rates are going up. And then now you look at your late signs of it, you're going to have a mental change. You're going to start noticing the lips are going to be a little different color. The fingertips are going to have coldness to them and you're going to have a weak radial pulse. Um, so right there, the first thing we want to do is we want to, you know, Administer supplemental oxygen before the signs of hypoxia get worse. If we catch it in the early stage, that's why we want to tell everybody, put them on some oxygen. You know, some people aren't going to tolerate the the regular uh, the regular mash. You may have to turn around and put them on a nasal cannula. You know, everybody's like, put them on a you know 15 liters. Well, if they're having right here, if they're having anxiety, they're not going to be able to tolerate that. So you may just have to you know let them hold it at their face like we do kids and let them do blow bys and, you know, breathe it that way because they're just not going to just able to take that mask. The mask is going to create their anxiety a little bit higher. So ventilation and perfusion must be matched to exchange gas by simple diffusion. Here we go. It gets a little deep again. Uh, with impaired ventilation, blood passes over the alveoli, but no gas is exchanged. So what they're trying to tell you is if you're doing hyperventilation or hypoxia, you're not having enough exchange to create the O2 there. So the, they're just, you, you don't have enough in there. Inadequate perfusion causes less oxygen absorption, like I just said, into the bloodstream, and less carbon dioxide removal. We got to get that carbon dioxide out. It's bad for us. That's obviously why some of us have CO2 detectors in our home, because we know CO2 can kill us. So we want to create the, you know, get them out in, in the fresh air. It may help you. Allow this, you know, this patient to step outside and breathe in some fresh air or put them in, uh, put them in front of a, a fan to help stimulate them to breathe clean air. So those right there will help them breathe, a, hopefully breathe a little bit faster and you may not have to put them on a regular mask at 15 liters. Uh, that may help them out. Interruptions to the central and peripheral nerve systems can uh, have factors in affecting the ventilation. Uh, hypercapnia. Overall increases the carbon dioxide levels in the bloodstream, which is a bad thing too, because we want to get that CO, the carbon dioxide out. Obviously, if we have a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, uh, trauma to the head or spinal cord, because all of our, our core, I call it our umbilical. Even though when we're born, they remove our umbilical. We have all the, our little umbilical that runs through our span, spinal cord that tells our brains to function. Uh, move your hand, talk. They tell us all these things, and if we have any trouble damage to that spinal cord, you probably gonna ha you potentially can have some issues with your uh, respiratory system because your brain's just not you know when it's firing, it's not getting the correct message to the right point. And you can have bronchoconstriction from allergic reaction. I'm sure at one point all of us have had some sort of react allergic reaction. It may or may not have affected our respiratory system, but now you can understand why. Is because it's it's you may either have a, it's hyperventilation, you may have some hypoxia of some small point where you're not getting enough ventilation uh, of of O2 into your body and it's filled up with uh, carbon dioxide. So when it starts getting filled up, you're gonna have the effects of just same thing. I can't breathe. 
So astringent factors like trauma and foreign body airway obstructions, you know, if there's uh, an impalement to the chest, obviously if it's, you know, punctured the lung, well, they can't breathe out of there, so they're gonna have shortness of breath. Respiratory splinting, uh, hypoventilation, which is, so you, it'll help you out guys out too, if y'all know that, you know, the some of your medical terms, hypo and hyper. Um, hypo is slow, it's like hypo, uh, and then hyper is rapid breathing. So if you see them and they're starting to, <laughs> are they really, when they're breathing super fast, are they going to be able to have proper ventilation? Anybody want to take a guess? Nope, not at all. You got to slow those breathing. You got to slow them down. You got to get them to where they can start being able to take deep breaths. It's okay if they have one or two word dyspnea and the dyspnea is where they're short. They can't only speak one to two words at a time. So it's okay for that, but try to slow that hyperventilation down. Uh, the rapid breathing is the carbon dioxide elimination seeds, but the carbon dioxide is, is still around. You've got to give it out. So hyperventilation and hypoventilation could represent that the body's attempt to compensate for the various abnormal conditions. Like you can have acalosis, which is going to be high blood pH, and acid, acidosis, which is a low pH. You may want to write those down if you got a chance, but the alkalosis is high pH in the blood, and acidosis is a low pH. It helps you out. So again, so either one of those, the hyper and the hypoventilation, can give you some ideas, can give you some information of what basically you're doing your your patient in, uh, impressions. What do I see out of this? What am I having? What, what's the patient doing? What's going on? Why is this patient acting like this? I don't understand what's going on. You're building your history with this patient, and it may just tell you they may be going in uh, acid, acidosis. Uh, decrease or increase in the minute volume can result in problems with carbon dioxide levels in the blood. We already know that's bad because they told us, but uh, the further you go into this, you'll learn why. Um, the carbon dioxide, we got to get it out of there. Got to clean our lungs out, clean our body, get rid of the garbage. So external factors, attachment of carbon monoxide molecules to the hemoglobin molecules can cause false pulse ox readings. So take a guess. Can somebody tell me why that's why it's going to give us wrong readings? All right, okay. So the carbon monoxide is going to attach to the hemoglobin, and it's going to tell you that it's it's got more th than it is. But what it's doing is it's blocking its release of the of the uh, I'm sorry, the carbon monoxide from leaving that hemoglobin cell to get more oxygenated. So you may see a, a mid to low 90 number on there, and what it's doing is it's the patient's still having you know they're talking I can't breathe because the hemoglobins are still, you know, they're still covered with the, the carbon monoxide. So put them on that O2, man. O2 is cheap. That's some of the cheapest stuff we got in the, in the truck. Put them on that O2. Give them some fresh air. You know, let them breathe that in for a couple of minutes and then check your CO2, I mean, your, uh, your pulse ox. That's going to help you out a little bit better. Some internal factors are conditions that reduce surface area of the gas exchange, uh, medical conditions such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema. And the COPD. Can anybody tell me what pulmonary edema is and why that's going to affect our respiratories? How about that? Correct. It is fluid in the lungs. And, you know, we're looking at the pneumonia too. The pneumonia and the pulmonary edema. You can see swelling of the legs, uh, can create, have an idea of fluid on the body. They may have an extra fluid on the body build up. But when you start hearing them talk about they, if they've had pneumonia or you see that they're on Lasix or something like that, if you start looking at it, just grab their medicines and you're handing them off to your partner or you're getting them ready to go to the hospital if you're on a basic truck and you see the Lasix, um, feet get super swollen and leak fluid. Yeah, they do leak fluid in kind of the later cases. Um, I have seen that. It's extremely gross. Uh, I try not to mess with those. 
That's uh, like crusty feet. I don't, I, don't, I don't do that. We cover that up and keep going. So, but we go with the, the swollen that give you ideas, their feet, their hands. It gives you an idea they have a, a lot of extra fluid in their body. COPD, you'll always see them sitting in a chair. They never lay flat because of all the fluid and they can't breathe. So your pink puffers and your blue bloaters, that'll come later down the road when we teach you some more about that. But your pulmonary edema, folks, will never, COPD and pulmonary, pulmonary edema is filling up their lungs with fluid. They're not going to lay down. You always want to see them in that little that little stair chair that uh, lifts up and then leans them down and it's an automatic chair form because and their beds also if you find them in the beds they're going to be elevated because they can't lay flat because they feel like they're drowning and they are because there's fluid all over them that's a bad part we don't want that um some other factors that uh, affect the oxygenation and respiratory will have change in the respiratory rate um other conditions include hypoxia hypoglycemia uh, an infection, they could be um, any type of infection. If their white blood cell count, white blood count is through the roof, you may see them on uh, oxygen when you're transporting them from the hospital to home. And uh, without sufficient glucose, the cell will be metabolized with fatty acids, resulting in ketoacidosis. So, ketoacidosis is going to really affect them. And that's the reason why they got to burn that off. Got to get that situated before they can leave. And hopefully we won't ever see somebody in that position. You may see them in the late states where they get in ketoacidosis at home, but that's way outside of your scope. Um, with their change in respiratory rates, uh, you may see their respi respirations go from normal to short and fast <laughs> because they're trying to create that pressure. Um, people with breathe in their lips that are very tight, like they're trying to whistle. That's building the pressure within their, their lungs so they can get that pressure to build it up. Uh, where it's talking about the non-functional alveoli, let's say on a smoker, it's just full. It's like you can't clean it out. You can't just go in there and have your alveoli cleaned out by a doctor. That's once you once it's closed off, that's it. You can sell it off to the you know the factory. You ain't getting no new ones. They're done. So that's going to affect your respiratory rates there too. Once the alveoli get full, um, let's see. All right, circulatory compromise. It's inadequate perfusion. So obstruction to the blood flow in individual cells. So if we start losing a lot of blood, we're going to have respiratory problem. Uh, we only got so much blood in the body. Somebody tell me how much blood we got in the body. Once you start losing the blood, things start shutting down. Once you start shutting down, your body starts, you know, resorting all the blood to the core. When we keep the core, certain things are going to function only, the heart, the lungs, the brain. And then you lose any more, and that, that may be it. Well, you may not be able to save that patient. And some conditions you may encounter, you may have a hemoneumothorax, which uh, hemothorax, then we go to the simple attention pneumothorax. Pulmonary embolism, I've taken care of several, several patients with PEs, the pulmonary embolism. Uh, I've done several needle decompressions. Uh, when I was overseas in the Middle East, I did a uh, chest tube out in the field. Um, that was a new one. Uh, I've only done one in my life. It was very, it was, it was a learning experience. Uh, the open pneumothorax, uh, if we got an open pneumothorax, we got to do something about that. Either you can put your hand on there initially first until you get your supplies ready. And then your uh, hemo and hemoneumothorax, your patient's going south. It, it's, it's going super south. Victoria, I like your statement about how many units of blood and it depends on their size. That's correct. I always jokingly say that Mississippi, we normally have larger folks. And so the different blood vessels, how much quantity of blood in there, we can't really base that if you're talking about Mississippi. So... Think about that when you're looking at all these conditions that are, why are just, why is my patient having trouble breathing? I've done everything in the world. Well, have you really, have you really listened to their lungs? Can you tell if they're having, you know, that tension pneumothorax because of a, a post cardiac, I mean, a, a post MVC a couple of days ago? How well did you do your history exam? Did you ask them on your patient assessment? Uh, what's different yesterday versus today or two days ago? When's the last time you felt well? Well, I was felt better before I had that really bad car wreck. Wait, wait, wait. let me give you some more information about this car wreck. 
So back into your pace and assessment like we did the other night. Build those questions. Ask them depending upon uh, what their condition is. Get that baseline. That's going to help you out. Whoops, sorry. I clicked on the wrong, wrong computer to go forward. All right. Heart failure and cardiac tamponade inhibits the ability to have effective fleet pump. Um, I'm just going to tell you, if you have a heart failure, you ain't going to get no respirations. Y'all know that. Come on. So I'm not going to say that's a no-brainer, but a hemorrhagic shock and the vasodilatory shock. Um, aggressive treatment to any patient suspect, suspected of being in shock is to prevent further interruptions to tissue perfusion because any kind of you start getting those tissues affected. And like we showed the clock a while ago in 10 minutes, think about in 10 minutes, what's going to happen to that patient. They could be potentially, you know, have permanent irreversible brain damage. So I swear some of my buddies have had some cut off of oxygen to their head, but they always say no, but then have no expiration reason why they're having issues. Uh, Victoria says, I believe about 10% of their body weight is blood. Uh, I'll have to look at that when we take a break in a minute. Now, I think you may be correct, but I'll have to double check. All right, so disruption by hypoventilation and hyperventilation. So you can also, sorry, you can also affect your patient if you're not breathing correctly for them over a long period of time or if you're breathing too fast for them. Um, obviously, if you're breathing, if you're doing a back bow mask, which we're going to go over in a little bit too, you could be blowing air from the, from the lungs, and it could be going down to the stomach, and then you're going to have the stomach swell up, and it's going to look like they just ate, and it's because of you because you're breathing too fast for them. So some of the main clinical presentations you're going to find is uh, respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis. Um, so the fastest way the body can eliminate excess um, H ions is to create water and carbon dioxide. Um, anything that inhibits respiratory function can result in the acid retention and acidosis. And then here's right here. Acidosis can be caused due to the low respiratory rate or tidal volume. So we got to build, we got to blow that acid off. We got to get rid of it. Not going to say hyperventilate them, but get their respiratories back to how many, how many times does an adult breathe per minute? Somebody take, tell me real quick. Victoria, I'm not sure. I think uh, it shows that there's 13 people, but uh, seems like there's only two, three. All right, 12 to 20. Hey, man, y'all paid attention in the respiratory section. So, look, there's everybody starting to talk. That's all you had to do, Victoria, is start poking buttons. Y'all are right. So 12 to 20. If somebody's breathing 8, 10 times a minute, that's not enough. You're going to have to build them back up. It's a, uh, Rob, what we were asking is how many times an adult breathe. So if they're breathing, like I said, eight to 10 times a minute, you got to blow that acid off. Well, that's right. So what we can do is, you know, breathe, you know, ventilate them properly with O2. Uh, for, uh, we read over that one. Let's see. Treatment for classic hyperventilation syndrome focuses on restoring the normal respiratory rate to increase carbon dioxide level. The body has to have so much in there to function. If it doesn't have enough in there, you'll start having all these trouble with all this fun stuff right here that you, you as basis can't fit in, fix in the field. So get them breathing right, put them on high flow O2, do your job and have a good time at it. All right, do the best thing you can do for the patient. All right, so got about ten more minutes. We'll take you a break. Recognizing adequate breathing. So how how are we gonna do that? How, what's our first thing we're going to be able to do when we're um, checking for adequate breathing? We, we can talk to them, right? We can ask them questions. If they're confused, maybe they have, you know, we can build a history from there. If they're going to start during our patient assessment, or they have, do they have normal respirations, 12 to 20 breaths a minute, adequate death, they're not having trouble speaking to us and answering our questions, and they're answering them correctly could give you some signs that they're already that they have good respiratory rate not having any trouble there you know some regular patterns of inhalation and exhalations 
listen to them. Hey, do you mind real quick if I listen to your lungs? I just want to make sure you're breathing right. Listen to the upper and lower lobes, lobes and then listen to their backs. Plus, it gives you an idea. You can actually get close to the patient. And as you're doing it, put your stethoscope on them. Reach down and fill a pulse at the same time. And that makes them think that you're, you're holding their hand at the same time and building that rapport if somebody's upset or having trouble breathing. You can build that. You can do both multiple things at a time. Uh, so here we go. Respiratory stress may be the result of obviously upper or lower airway obstruction. Uh, if they may have swallowed something, they may turn around and have a blockage. Uh, inadequate ventilation means that they're just would be an acidosis. Uh, impairment of the respiratory muscles, impairment of the nervous system. Maybe they were Maybe they do have something wrong with their cervical injury, and now their their spine is messed up. Dyspnea, like I talked a while ago, may result of hypoxemia. So I'm doing fine. And you hear how I'm taking deep breaths, and I'm trying to talk, and it's one to two words. And if they, they're having to pause to answer your question, like, hey, how's it going today? I'm, I'm okay. That gives you a hint. Something's wrong. Why, why are they having trouble answering simple questions today? You know, what day of the week it is, and if it takes them like three breaths to answer you saying it's Saturday, that gives you a heads up that something's going on. Um, patients with respiratory stress often compensate with peripheral uh, positioning. You'll see that a lot in kids. Um, we call it also an adult's tripod position. They may be standing up, one arm leaned over, hanging on to something, and that gives them that the weight off their chest so they have like the barrel chest and they want to lean forward to get the pressure off their chest so they can take that deep breath or if they have copd or they have you know fluid on them they take that fluid pill and they hadn't had the money to buy that fluid pill lately that's why they're having trouble breathing uh that's right there dyspnea is a difficult and respiratory rate regulatory or effort maybe the result of uh, like we said hypoxemia Untreated hypoxia will result in uh, death in the body's cells and tissues because they don't have enough air. We got to have air going in and out to keep things going. The brain needs it too. Sorry, I was trying to take a deep breath and drink some water. All right. When you assess your patient with respiratory distress, what position did you find them in? Are they, like I just described, in that tripod position? Are they having uh, right fall, rise and fall of the chest? Is the patient gasping? What color of the skin is it? When you reach out and touch them, are they, are they moist and clammy? Could they be t potentially having a cardiac issue? Um, when you touch them, you're like, oh, that's, that's gross. You can feel it through your glove. You want to know if they're... <sighs> Got that open mouth breathing. I'm actually doing it like y'all can actually see me because I hadn't turned my camera on yet. Um, so you you get those things. You want to know um, if they're positioned. Are they sitting on something with their that in that tripod position with their elbows and they're trying to hold their head and they're leaned over? That's that's a telltale sign that they this is not their first time to have this. They know what position is the best for them and that gives them the most air. Um, if you've seen it once, you'll you'll always be able to point it out every single time. I don't wish the worst on anybody, but when you go to do some of your clinicals and all that and you see these people, pay attention. Um, I've always told people when they're getting into their career, EMS, fire, police, keep a log from day one to the time you stop. I haven't done it in 20 years. Um, now that I'm offshore, I do keep a log of everything I've taken care of, and it's I see things and change and how I take care of patients in a little bit more of an aggressive way versus when I can remember when I was first starting out, I was nervous. I was scared to do something. You guys will see that too in the way that you'll be like, oh, I've seen that before. If I don't, you know, jump on that because they're you know, bent over and they're in that tripod position, the patient's going to go south. That's your general impression. So jump on that, get it going. And you know what to do. Uh, is there nasal flares? You can see that. I, I'm not going to sit here and flap my nose so y'all can see when I have my camera off, but you know what I'm talking about. Do you know any retractions? Is their lips pursed? So what I mean by that is, like I was saying a few minutes ago, imagine trying to take a drink out of a bottle, and you kind of put your lips down over it because you don't want to spill water all over the place. 
people breathe like that too because they want to create the pressure and helps them breathe. It's kind of like, uh, let's say we were all had to do 40 yard sprints. I'm probably going to need some oxygen when we get done, but we're going to breathe like that because we're trying to build that pressure and we're trying to get as much air as we can. Is the patient any using the accessory muscles to breathe? The stomach's coming in, the stomach's going out. That's, that's their accessory muscles. Is their chest wall moving sym symmetrically? Oh, that word got me. So what I want to know is, are they have like that, like the uh, the abdomen's going out? I'm sorry, I was looking at different things. Their chest is going together. You're not one side going different than the other. Oh, I'm with you. I'm going to go. I'm going into cardiac arrest. I do any spritz. That's why I got a truck. I drive. Um, is the patient taking a series of quick breaths followed by prolonged exhalation phase? Because they're trying to keep that pressure within their body. It's kind of like <sighs> they hold their breaths and then they try to not let all the air out because they know they're already winded. They don't want to get that air out. Um, look right here. So your pectoral muscles, your rectus abdominal. So all these labored breathing patients with inadequate breathing may appear to working hard to these areas. You'll see their their side muscles right here on the neck. Y'all know y'all have seen that before. Anytime you look at some of your geriatric patients or your you know trauma patients, if some of you guys are already working on trucks and stuff like that, you'll see it there on my marker. And then there, you want to make sure these are moving equally. And you don't see this side over here coming up higher than the right side. Or if their abdominal mother's muscles are, you ain't going to see mine like that. But when you have this right here, when it when there are stomachs coming, you know, helping them breathe because stomachs going out, going in, going out, and it's not like normal. We do, you'll notice even when you're laying there, your stomach muscles will move for you to breathe because your diaphragm's relaxing and contracting. But what's different? What's abnormal? That That's one of those. Is their respiratory rate lower than 12 or higher than 20 because they can't, they're having trouble breathing? Um, so. Are they having an irregular respiratory rate? I don't think we go over you know, respiratory uh, in this chapter. I think that's more of an advanced thing. But it tells you the different regular. Uh, is it regularly regular? Or do you notice that it's an irregular rate for them? But that may be their normal because that's what they've had trouble breathing for so long that they, they have issues. Is it diminished or absent? Or they actually have noisy when you... You hear somebody breathe and you hear that. <laughs> you're kind of looking around like, well, what, what's that noise? Because if you've never heard it before, you, you don't know that somebody's having trouble breathing. And that may be their normal. We talked about the abdominal breathing. Get their stomach to help them. Uh, unequal and adequate chest expansion. What just like what's what's wrong? Why, why is your chest doing that? It's OK to ask them. You just don't want to make fun of the patient because that may be something normal for them. That may be the idea that they have. That's their normalcy of their chest has the issues moving back and forth. I'm going to try to hit this one last slide and then we'll take a break. Because I got to have some more water, too. All right. So they increased effort to breathe. Can you notice that they're having trouble and they like this? their effort is completely different from the last two people that you just left from. Uh, a lot of the things that we're seeing now is the COVID struggling to have issues with people for breathing. Uh, you may get called for respiratory and you realize that they, it's because they're symptomatic from COVID. Is it a shallow depth and not a normal deep breath like we do? We can take that really deep breath. You may see uh, some patients just <sighs> because it's really short. They're not taking good adequate ventilations. Is the skin pale, cyanotic, cool, molted, or moist? Well, that's, I hope they're not pale or cyanotic or cool because we're going to have trouble in the end of it. Any retractions? Um, is their speech patterns off? You know, like I told you, they're having trouble talking to you because they can't, they can't breathe. Listen to their breathing. Put your stethoscope that you just spent lots of money on and going to school to listen to them. Feel for air movement. If you're having trouble figuring, like, I don't know what kind of breath patterns they're having. Find a mirror somewhere in this patient's house. Maybe your partner's makeup mirror and hold it over their, you know, their mouth or nose. And do you see that 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 mist coming out? Do you see the 
the fog being built up. And look for paradoxous movement. I mean, we got to find out what's going on. So there's ways for we can, you know, assess a respiratory rate and check their breathing and still make the patient feel calm. So think about that. We're going to take about 10 minutes of break. I got to go do something real quick. I just saw an email pop up and we'll be back. Uh, do y'all have any quick questions right now? All right. No questions. I will see y'all in 10 after. All right, guys. See y'all in a little bit.
All right, folks. Hey, I know we're back real quick. Um, before we get going, I'm going to send you guys a message. I just want to make sure that everybody saw the Facebook post that Robert made. I think it was yesterday about 430. The class will be going back to the Tuesday, Thursday evening rotation. This is going to start on the 9th of February. So that is... We're going to go to Tuesday, Thursdays, so I hope that works for everybody. I'm pretty sure it works for me because I'm, I'm glad we that's what Robert and I worked out. Um, I like the Tuesday, Thursday versus a Saturday night. So um, if you have any questions or anything, please post it on there to Robert so he can answer your questions from there. Um, all right, yeah. Correct. We will go uh, the first and the third is what I show that our next meetings will be, Rob. I um, want to make sure that pretty sure that's right. I think that's what we talked about is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Monday, Wednesday, and then we'll go to the 9th and the 11th and continue out Tuesday, Thursdays. Everybody good with that? I hope so. All right, let me close that message out so I won't pay attention to that. All right, back on to it. Um, where we leave? Okay, so increased effort of breathing. Uh, all right, we talked about that one. I can skip that one. Sorry. Got to find my mouse again. All right, so here's just a little bit. We'll talk about the chain Stokes breathing. Um. Productive reflexes in the airway, serious head injury may result in irregular, ineffective respirations that may or may not have indefinitely uh, patterns. So it's it's different right here. If you'll know, sorry, I was on the wrong. So you'll know you'll go short, short, breathe real fast, breathe real fast, slow down, slow down, and you'll pause for a little bit. And it, the gap is what it's showing you from one minute to one minute, and you'll notice how it's changed. See how it's Real tight here, gets a little spaced out on the respirations real fast, but shallow. And then they go into some pauses of apnea. They pick it up again, but it's not as fast as it started out to be. So you notice it's changing from one minute to the next minute. So that's where you really got to pay attention. So chain stokes is something that you may not pick up on the first time. Uh, that's why you got to keep an eye on your patient. So this is, is a constant changing and it can be a pattern that may go on for two or three minutes. And then you may not see again for, you know, 10, 15 minutes later. It's, uh, I've seen it twice in my life and both of them have been due, due to, uh, major traumas. Uh, agonal gasp, that's, those gasps are not life sustaining. So you'll see, uh, I always joke around and say like, you see the fish when you throw them on the ground after you fishing. You don't want to put them back in the water because you may not have a hook to put them on when they sit there. You put them there and you see the fish just go, they open their mouth. That's gasping. So it's not going to work. It's not going to sustain life. It's not going to do them anything. Uh, that's the end stages of life. Be vigilant when monitoring patients in respiratory stress because they can go south very fast. You don't want to have any delay in fixing that respiratory distress. Don't let it be your fault when you start documenting later on that you weren't ready. All right. So your LOC, your skin color, and excellent indicators of respiration. It's great. I mean, they're like, man, they just don't look good. Go with your gut instincts like we talked about last uh, the other night. Uh, what is their baseline of mental status? You need to go off what's the first thing that you saw of that patient. So that's your baseline. So then you consider your proper oxygenation when assessing the patients. Do you need to put them on a nasal cannula or can you put them on a regular non-rebreather? Well, what's their, how fast are they breathing? Are they struggling to breathe? You know, and then we have this great little tool called a pulse oximetry. I don't know, how many of y'all out of the 15 that's here, how many of y'all currently work for an EMS service? Or does anybody work for an EMS service? All 
All right. So James Fire Department, Mel, yes. So everybody has a basic concept of things, how it goes. Um, so you may have used these tools uh, when it comes to your first aid calls. You may turn around and have, you know, hey, look, put the, the pole socks on them. You may not know initially what it did, but now you, you know what it's done. Um, I, um, give me one second. I'm going to go grab some stuff so we can show. Um, Victoria's saying she can't hear. Let's say yes. Hold on. All right. So, can anybody else? Everybody hears me. Is that right? I mean, I know some of y'all responded. So. All right, so at least hopefully y'all are all right. Good, majority of the group is hearing me, so that's good, guys. I'm gonna turn my camera on to go over some stuff. Uh, I mean, I know y'all have probably seen these before, so I apologize. Um, like I said, I'm offshore, so I just don't think it's the point of shaving anytime soon. Um, so guys, this is what our pole socks is. We can see it here. Um, I'm trying to get away. All right, so these pole socks has a top and a bottom. Um, if you can see right there, I know my camera kind of stinks, but there's a good way to put it on. I always try to remember is put the top piece with the cord on the finger like that. Doesn't really matter what kind of device it is. It could be like this one right here that you see on the screen, this one over here, or it could be just like this one. That one's more of a portable one. Uh, the one that I have is connected to my LifeBag 12. So this one stays here. A lot of people will try to put them on different. Well, there's a reason why there's actually a finger that's the impression that's built on there. So you can kind of get that. It's a finger probe. So it kind of breaks it down. I'm trying to get my mouse to work. All right. So you see that. So it goes on there. Leave it on there for a couple of seconds. Like we talked the other night. If you happen to have, like Victoria pointed out, the fake nails, the fingernail polish. That's what we carry the stuff for. So you can turn around and remove it. Once you get that off, that will help you out and it'll get you a better um, pulse. <laughs> it's cause I quit caring and had to, I could shave. I didn't have to shave anymore, Victoria. So once you leave it on there, you may have to, you know, kind of give it the right fixture. Uh, it fits kind of snug. If y'all have never used one before, break it out, put it on yourself. Once you put it on yourself, you're able to, you know, get a baseline. So you know, all right, well, I'm not having any trouble breathing. I'm not having any problems. Um, right. Make it good. Make sure the finger is warm because, Mickey, why can't, well, if the finger is cold, what are we going to get? So just help everybody else out. Personal experiences, you don't get a reading at all. Bingo. So, and it may be something we want to hold their hand. Be nice to them. You know, we, uh, that will help them out. If we want to do it that way, I'm going to turn my camera off so I don't scare you guys anymore. All right, so make sure that finger's warm. Uh, hold their hand. Be like, whoa, darling, sir, what's going on? Are you, you good? You cold? That may be normal for them. We may have to revert to the old Band-Aid type of uh, finger probe because that'll help them out. Uh, you could get a better connection that way. Um, so that was a very, very good point, Megan. I appreciate you saying that. That was uh, on point there. Um, so identify high-risk patients for respiratory conditions at monitoring the oxygen saturation of a patient during an attempt to insert advanced airway. So you can say, hey, this patient's not doing good. I'm noticing that the sats are dropping. Uh, let's see what else I got written down here. So circumstances that may produce erroneous readings or the ambient light. So you saw a lot of UV lights here lately. We're getting kind of these high tech without the the blue light you know uv lights in these buildings now i i don't get them but sometimes the blue the bright lights will will be a hard time to read uh the the constant movement of a patient oh my god 
and that's one of our pet peeves is to please quit moving you the probes coming off uh poor perfusion completely maybe they just have overall poor perfusion and they just not breathe in the air um nail polish we already said that um abnormal hemoglobin you know, that may be because of their the carbon dioxide sticking to it instead of the oxygen and uh don't make treatment decisions just based off the pulse ox. If the pulse ox is low, don't automatically like, oh, we gotta innovate, we gotta, we gotta drop an airway. Maybe you just need to adjust it, and that may help you out. Or like make you point out, warm their hand up. That may be part of it. Change hands. Put let them put their hand in their underarm and help warm it up for a minute while you're talking to them, getting an assessment. That's probably one of the better things to do is start start off with your basics. All right. Oh, come on, slide. So we're going to assess the peak expiratory flow of measurement. Guys, I've never done this in the field, checking their flow. Um, what this does is it, it, it helps evaluate. I mean, obviously, y'all can read the bronchoconstriction. Um, I don't really know how to tell you this because I've never had to do this in the field in my 20 plus years. Um, I know that's more of a clinic setting. You can see in the background. Um, I know it will it'll all vary because it's based on the sex, the height and the weight and the age. All that is different. So it's done. And so you check your peak flow by three different readings. You do it three different times, your best, medium and your, your low. All that helps with the expiratory flow. I don't really know how else to tell you guys because I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, it's just not been in the, you know, the the my array or my toolbox shall I say. So I do have a little deficit on teaching, teaching that because of the point. Um, we'll go over here some uh, arterial blood glasses, gases. You'll see them uh, draw those in the hospitals. It tells us if our ABG values uh, are you know, on the table. The maintain abnormal uh, air blood gases, the balance of the uh, between the alveolar, OV, OLR, a volume perfusion of the capillaries must be maintained. It tells us all kind of cool things. Your entitled carbon dioxide assessment. So we have an entitled CO2 detector when we are once we put them on a once we innovate somebody because we need to know if we have the the right exchange of O2. Like right there, you have your color metric, your digital, your digital waveform. Um, a lot of agencies always go to color metric. That is the basic, the easiest. Honestly, it's the cheapest too. And then your digital waveform. Uh, stand by real quick. I have one out here I can show you guys. If y'all stand by, let me go over to my bag, my ALS bag, and pull it out. Bring it back over to y'all. All right, stand by for again on the ugly moment. I turn the camera back on. All right, so this will talk about your. I'm going to swap back so I can see. So it's all bundled up in here. So this goes over your two. So if your paramedic says, hey, hand me the CO2 detector. Oh, I don't know where it's at. That may be a problem. So this is a simple little thing. Screws into your life pack 12. Uh, cores are supposed to come out very easy without wrapping up. It's never going to happen. It's always going to create a knot. Make sure it doesn't get flowed up, uh, coiled up, kind of get tweaked and pinched. So that's another way for the digital. The color metric, um, we don't carry the color metric offshore. Um, so we do have some moisture issues. I don't know if y'all ever guessed that with the salt water. So that does cause a little issue out here. Um, let's see, I'll get rid of that so y'all aren't harmed. Uh, let's see. So those are important. It's a tool that helps us monitor the exchange of the entitled, uh, the CO2 detections. So that's very important for us, it helps us out. Uh, we just gotta have that extra tool. Here's some, hang on, I gotta. So there's a picture of it, your color metric right here, changes colors, and it'll actually tell you good, bad, and ugly, which ones you need to keep it in. It's more of the higher advanced level. I'm just gonna let y'all see it there. And this is your digital one down here. Um, 
I don't really go into big into that because it's not really going to matter to you guys. Just unfortunately, you just may have to hand it off to them. Um, here's your good numbers. You're entitled. Your respiratory rate. So it, it's it helps you know like here if you're bagging well, if you're not bagging enough. That's just I've never seen one of these because they're very expensive and they are reusable. But you gotta think uh, that's somebody else's cooties going in there. It gotta be cleaned a certain way. And uh, too many agencies around here just don't pay that much money for them. Um, so here's a capnography. So you'll see this on your machine, on the LifePak 12, different waveforms. Uh, so it'll give you real-time information regarding the patient's exhale carbon dioxide, see how it drops down, picks up, goes down. This is all through a one-second one time frame. Um, right down here, these are the, what I just showed you right here. We'll go on the tube. This is the same thing as a uh, nasal prongs. Uh, you can also use that with C uh, with a normal O2. It'll hook up also to a same uh, same connection. And these are the little ports I was telling you about that screw into the machine to the LifePak 12. Um, sometimes you'll go into certain hospitals that may not have the LifePak 12 capability. It's okay if you can pull those out and you can cut it off. It's still not going to disrupt you from giving the patient proper O2 through this part right here. This is where you get your CO2 detection down here. It monitors, it sends it all back to this machine a lot faster and a lot more details, anything like that. Also right in here, everybody knows about your ROS, return of circulation out in the field. Those are really good. If you get uh, effective of chest compressions, you have all these cool things that you can use out in the field. You just gotta remember your basics, airway, breathing, and circulation. That's all you gotta do. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. All right, so to open the airway and assess breathing, the patient needs to be in a supine and position. It's correct, we all know that. Here it is, it's open. Uh, you see how the tongue is actually fallen back a little bit. Well, because it's, that's the big muscle. So the tongue right there in that particular picture is blocking the airway. Uh, how are we gonna fix that? What's our first step, folks? Somebody give me an idea. What are you gonna do? Anybody want to guess? All right, so if this is blocking the airway, what is the first thing we can do to open the patient's airway? Jaw thrust, what else? What's another one? How about this one? Look at there, head tilt, chin left. When are we not going to use a head tilt chin lift? Anybody know? Correct. If we suspect spinal injuries, neck injuries, anything like that that may compromise the movement of the C-spine. Hang on, guys. Let me go turn that big speaker off. I don't need to listen to it tonight. All right, so that's out of the way. Sorry about that. All right, so here we go. Position yourself beside the patient, you know, maybe at the head. You can do it from the head of, uh, you can do it from the side. You can see this particular person right here is on the side of them. You can also do it at the head. Place one hand on the patient's forehead and tilt the patient, the back of the head. So if everybody, I wish it was easier to do. If you had a child or something like that you can you, you can do and, and let them just relax and they'll actually do it to you there's kind of like an anatomical position that your head will go to and it'll just sit there not saying it's going to stay in that head tilt chin lift position that's why you got to keep your hand on the head but if you everybody do me a favor look straight up you'll notice how your mouth will start to pull open a little bit so that's kind of the, the what we're going for here and then it says when you lift the chin upward Bring the entire jaw with it and help tilt the head. So all we're doing is just keeping the whole piece together, keeping the mouth shut. We're going to push the head back with our, in this particular person, picture that lady or person is using their right hand. Their left hand is just holding the bottom of the jaw. Uh, all right, so it says, lift it so the teeth are nearly brought together, but avoid closing the mouth completely. Continue to hold the forehead to maintain the, the backward tilt of the head. So all we are is just going to open it. We're going to try to do the, it's 
it's just a head tilt chin lift. What that's doing is it's moving the tongue out of the way, opening the airway, and that's just a simple maneuver. Here, it's a jaw thrust. You're gonna have to be more at the head of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's still doable if you're at the side, but you're gonna have to do it more by the side, I mean, the top of the head. Jaw thrust maneuver is using the method of the cervical spine injury like we talked about and was, when y'all just put it out there. So this is the only thing that you're gonna do is a jaw thrust if you think that they have some type of you know, neck injury, back injury, we just wanna be extra careful. Perform the jaw thrust maneuver on an adult. Here's our steps. Kneel at the, above the patient's head, place fingers behind the angles of the lower jaw and move the jaw upward. Use your thumbs to help position the lower jaw to allow breathing through the nose and the mouth. So here's my mouth. So we wanna take their thumbs on each side of the jaw and push down at right around the back side of the jaw and the ear where it connects. When you, you'll basically just move your, your uh, fingers in and your thumb, you're, you're gonna kinda squeeze your hands together. Hey, I'm gonna show y'all, let's come back here. All right. So if I'm holding the patient, basically I'm gonna squeeze and I'm gonna push. So you're gonna rotate it like this so their jaw goes forward and you're gonna pull the jaw back. Does that kind of make sense to y'all? Uh, just showing y'all like that. So if I'm holding them, I'm gonna push just like that. It'll open the, pull the jaw back and then it'll push the jaw the right around the chin down. I know that's, I hope that kind of helped. I don't know if y'all got to see that, if it worked out at all. Um, it won't go. All right, tongue jaw lift. Uh, use the open airway for a, an OPA for uh, suctioning or, and place hand on the forehead. Well, so here we go. I'm not a fan of this. So I'm just gonna tell y'all. Says reach into the patient's mouth and hook your first knuckle under the incisors or gum line. Guys, I, don't, put, don't put your hands in people's mouth. You only got one hand. One, you got two thumbs, 10 fingers. If they bite down some form of fashion, you ain't getting it back. Just, just don't put your hands in there. You can do the same thing by just holding the lip, uh, push down on the jaw. Just, yes, they will bite you, Victoria. That's, that's correct. Um, perform these jaw thrust, these jaw, the tongue jaw lift maneuver. You position yourself at the head, place the hands closest to the patient's on the forehead. With your other hand, again, I hate when it says this, reach your hand into the mouth, hook your first knuckle under the incisors of the gum line while holding the patient's head and maintaining the head on the forehead, lift the jaw straight up. I don't like that one, guys. I just don't want to put my hands in somebody's mouth. It's just like grabbing a fish, correct, but they're trying to get you to go between the gum line and the, and the lip instead of behind the teeth. Um, I just, it's kind of hard to tell you how to do that when it's its very scary to, for you to accidentally get bit. So here's the recumbent position, the recovery position. This is going to be basically everybody can do this. It's simple. Put them on their side. This particular person is laying on her left side. And the way to do it in a very easy, so if you're, let's say you're doing a, a mass casualty incident and this person is breathing but they're unresponsive you don't want to leave them on their back or anything like that then you can go off and attend some other people and you continue on through your mass casualty once they're on their sorry i'm moving the mouse like y'all can see but it's on my desktop you're moving this if their feet are on top of each other move their right leg off and this is going to keep them from rolling over and bend it you want to keep it in that position right there so and then their left arm you want to stick their, I've always stuck their left arm straight out. And the reason why it's basically to keep them from rolling forward. Now, yes, potentially they can roll backwards, but I haven't seen it because they're going to majority be leaning over right in this area and put their, their right arm right underneath their head to protect it. If they do go forward, it's the kind of, it's the keep of a rocking motion is basically what it is. And they'll lean, you notice how she's leaning forward just a little bit on this way. It'll, it'll kind of keep it in their position. It doesn't have to be in a traumatic position, but it just helps. Um, let's say place the patient in the recovery position if he or she is breathing uh, on a normal rate and an adequate tidal volume. 
It does not have to be from a traumatic injury. Uh, we talked about the steps on how to roll them. That is a very simple task that can be done and it's very quick and uh, they can breathe on their own that way. Um, so have some more tools here. Uh, turn my camera back on so y'all can see these. Um, so out here we do have these, uh, these hand pumps. Uh, basically it's just, it's manual. If you can hear it. So in this one right here has a canister. So some that I have seen, you put down, you you suck it up, and you come over here and you flush it out. I don't really like that because I don't want to see it anymore. This one's pretty simple. It's got some bevels on the end. It just plugs on. You'll hear it snap. That's connected. All right. And this one also has a a little check valve. So if you close it, you notice it's not gonna. You can hear it as it has trouble. You can adjust the rate on this one if you only want to do half. They want to do a, a 50% or 100%. And once that's connected, that's there. Now, on ours out here, we have two tubes. That one's very large versus this one. So we use it on, depends on the size of the patient. So we store ours like this in the same bag. And it's very easy once you connect it on here. You kind of put your finger over there, your gloved hand, and make sure there's suction. That's if you don't have portable suction. Uh, you'll be able to have one of these. I'm not sure if y'all have ever used one of these. They're a little different. Um, they're not common. They uh, Some ambulances will have them as a backup, but uh, that's just what we keep offshore because we got to get them to our clinic somehow or another. Um, this one down here, uh, you'll see, I'm gonna, hold on two seconds. Um, you'll see right down here, that's a wall-mounted unit. Could be inside of your unit. Um, but you want to make sure you check that, make sure you got power. Only suction for 15 seconds at a time. That's correct. We're going to hit that in just a second. I'm glad you said that early. But with the manual hand pump, you're, you're not going to get to that. It's going to, you literally squeeze once and it's only going to be out of there. It's not like these uh, mechanical, I mean, the powered ones that you can adjust the power right here. I mean, the suction volume here, the canister. Only do it for 15 seconds. I always like to say I try to hold my breath. And if I want, I have to take a deep breath, so do they. And here you'll notice you have your tubings, you'll have your long tube, you'll have portable suction, you'll have wall mounted suction. And the reason why we have both is because once you're out of the truck versus coming in the truck, and then what's going to happen no matter what you do in your, your world, one's going to die. Most likely your, your portable unit. You'll have it charged really good, and the shift that relieves you, they didn't charge it, and it's going to die on you when you need it. So that's always nice. It's always B-shift fault. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, it's always B-shift. All right. So suction units sh should be fitted with um, wide bore, thick walled, non-kinking tubing, and that is all, all this right here. Comes in a little package. All that's spelt. Most of your ambulance services and your fire departments buy all that together. So you don't have to worry about, you know, it's all in one little neat little package. A lot of people have gone to these units right here. Um, ours is more hard, uh, hard mounted plastic out here. Um, I'll show you what we carry out here. Give me two seconds. All right, so ours is pretty big, as you can see. Um, we test ours weekly. We can adjust the pressure here. Um, ours is just push button. Everybody else's. You have your throwaway connection tube with your biohazards. This tube always stays with your unit. Um, you can see even on this one down here, there's a little, this one right here is disposable, but that's fine because it's a direct in there. So this one always stays in the unit. So if you're having a unit like this, don't throw this tube away because they're going to talk bad about you. These containers are always throwable, throw away. But make sure, and I'll tell you from an experience, put the caps on the holes. You don't want the stuff coming out. Here's the pack I was telling you about. It comes together. It has your yanker. Uh, we carry a French in here. So if we have to do any kind of deep suctioning, um, we can also do that. But it all stays together, stays packed on the unit. And we're not always trying to look for anything. If I'm out on uh, working on somebody on our deck out here on the field, 
I can send somebody upstairs to the clinic and grab this unit. The hand unit stays in all of our ALS bags. Um, does it's, it's mountable to our uh, stretchers that the air med comes in here and picks them up. Now, when I say air med, I'm not speaking specifically of Acadian, but I'm talking about our air transport units. And like I was saying the other night, no matter what, it's a three hour trip. It's about 30 minutes notice, an hour and 10 minutes out here, and an hour and 10 minutes back. So right at three hours of patient care that uh, most likely it's going to take two hours to notify an uh, air med transport at night. And for us to notify air med transport at night, it has to be a cardiac arrest or a trauma or it's a criteria that we have to treat before we go offshore at nighttime. We, we require air medical transport. It's a little different than shoreside. Uh, Victoria, those wall ones, I got to make sure to put finger over the hole to suction. That's correct. Didn't learn that until I was suctioning a cardiac arrest patient and feel like an idiot. Sometimes there is a little bitty hole. Um, I do suggest that you take the unit out when you start in your service. If you've never been out there before, that you uh, you you play with it. You got to put your hand on it to know how your equipment is. I know that when you go to do some of your hands-on skills, a lot of these equipment will be there and just literally just touch it. It's yours. You got to you got to make sure you know how to use your equipment before you get out in the field, get turned loose, start doing things on your own. Um, let's see. All right. So we'll talk about the suction catheter here, right in here. Here's the little little bitty hole that Victoria was talking about. The suction catheter is a hollow cylinder device used to remove fluids and secretions away. I hate that word. I hate secretions. I really do. So it's a tonsil tip catheter, soft plastic, non-rigid catheter is the French. So this one right here, and that is more of the paramedic level. Um, higher than that also that we can do deep suctioning if we need to suction down in the tube. Like if we're having trouble, uh, we can use them for cardiac arrest too, post-cardiac arrest. Uh, out here, I insert them NG tubes, nasal gastric tubes. For any cardiac arrest that we have out here, I can insert that and also help secrete the uh, any kind of nasty stuff. All right, here we go. Steps to operate the suction unit. There it is. Make sure that it's working, the battery's charged. Turn on the suction unit and test to ensure that the vacuum pressure, here's a good one, that is no more than 300 uh, millimeters of mercury. That probably is a test question, guys. And so is the bottom one. Limit the suction time for 15 seconds for adults, 10 seconds for children, and five seconds for infants. I'm gonna start and read that all over again. Turn on the suction unit and test it to ensure that the vacuum pressure is no more than 300 millimeters of mercury. All right, and limit your suction time to 10 minutes, 10, <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 seconds for adults, 10 seconds for children, and five seconds for infants. That's how serious we are. It, it, you need to know that. Uh, Victoria brought it out earlier, that's important. Uh, you can tell it's stuck in her mind, she wanted to move. So as you're suctioning, uh, like I said, don't put your fingers in their mouth. We have tools, we have uh, forceps, and you only wanna attempt to remove any object that is visible when the mouth is open. And don't just go on blind, dip, digging don't go on a safari hunt only look for it there if for some odd reason when you're suctioning it out and your and your yanker and tube gets clogged up use some sterile water that's on your unit and try to clear it out through there try to suction it out you may have to get a whole new tubing unit because something has messed it up or it's clogged up and you're not going to be able to fix it at all uh let's see here so past the suction catheter this is when they're talking about if they can do deep suctioning, um, that right there is not really y'all's level. We teach it to you guys so just so you know what they're doing. If they say, hand me the, you know, the deep suctioning, they may call it all these different names. But if that's, don't worry about it. It's not your job to do that. And it's a pretty good picture. I'll give it credit. It looks like they're actually doing it there. So it's basically the same way. You see the patient's. Uh, see the provider's fingers right here. So that's actually providing suction. If he removes it, it basically can go any way. Correct, Victoria. You only suction on the way out, not on the way in. 
So if that being the case, he's already pushed it down into this way, and he's pulling the tube out and suctioning on the way out because his finger's over it. That's very important. So now we're going over OPAs. So these right here are oral. So they only go in the mouth. We'll go over the ones in the nose in a second. They often use in conjunction with the bag valve mask. They should be inserted in unresponsive patients with no gag reflex. I know you see these random videos on YouTube, or y'all may know somebody that doesn't have a gag reflex. And like, look, I can put an OPA in. There you are. Now you know. So I'm going to ask y'all a question, and I want y'all to see if y'all can answer this. What are the different sizes of OPAs? There's four different sizes. See if you can tell me. I'll give y'all a couple of seconds on this one. Uh, I want y'all to kind of think about this. You see right here, somebody just guess. It's all right. What are the four sizes of OPAs? I'm going to type it out. Whoops, I'll back it up. Sorry about that. There we go. Hey, y'all are answering very good. So, uh, small, medium, large, extra large. That, actually, that's the way I learned it when I first started this. And be like, hey, give me that big one. This dude's got a big old mouth. That's not really true. So, there I'm going to type it out for you. I've already done. So, the OPAs come in um, 80 millimeter, 90 millimeter, 100 millimeter, and 110. Normally, the colors are 80 is green, 90 is yellow, one, uh, 100 is a red. And a 110 is an orange. Now, I have on this one, I don't know what black, white, and green and orange are in this particular picture. But normally, that's how when you get them, some of them may not be colored at all. Um, I actually have hours out here somewhere. Yep. Stand by. I'm trying to reach over and grab something. All right, so I'll leave this camera on for a second. But see, ours out here are not colored at all. It's, it's not. So you have your basically your medium and your large, and that's pretty big, I can tell you. So like your orange one in this picture is about like the same size as this one, and here it is. Um, if it doesn't cover it, I'll show you how to, uh, to measure in just a second. But we're going to go over your nasal ones. So you want to use this one with patients with a gag reflex and... I'm trying to look for my other question. And and one is unable to tame the, the airway. These also have to have some lubricating. Uh, you can use KY. So if you don't have the KY that's on you or in your bag, and which is supposed to be with these, you can actually open the patient's mouth, swallow them in there. Their mouth, not yours, because you're putting a different body fluid in theirs. And you can insert it in there. So again, I'm going to ask you on this one. Whoops, changed the wrong one. What are the different sizes of NPAs? Anybody want to take a guess? So size, all these come in, so we're going to talk mainly about the adults. Sorry. I want to know about the sizes of adult. That's right. So that's correct. Uh, Victoria, so it is six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm going to read exactly what it says um, on here, and I'm going to show you there. So they do... Six to nine centimeters is the uh, adult. They do six to seven should be considered the small adult for a small frame adult. Seven to eight is medium. And eight to nine is a large. Um, I don't know if you guys can see these. So I'll start off with the small ones. So there you are. That is a pretty small one right there. Um, these are actually what we use. I mean, they're called a, this one's a 22 French. This one is a 26 that should be starting around your small uh, adult. Um, this one is a 34. That one is very long and pretty big. And this is your 36 French. That is massive, y'all. I mean, it's huge. I I don't know. I don't know if y'all can see that, but I mean, that's about the size of my pinky, y'all. 
that's pretty big. Um, just gonna let you know if you put that in on somebody and they have to, and they use it and they come back around and they're mad at you, I I can feel it and I can understand why. Um, so Victoria said you measure from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe for the um, OPAs and then. Derek can't use MPA if the palate of the mouth is damaged. That's correct. So if you expect uh, mouth damage or they've had a mouth, tra mouth trauma, anything to that matter, you can't use the oral. You can go nasal, but you got to consider if there's damage there. Uh, people can say that you can take the uh, nasal pharyngeal airway. You can go into their brain and affect them that way. May has the ones that I can remember, maybe like three in my career that I've heard of it nationwide and I may say worldwide because I do try to read a lot so I don't know how many people that has ever had these shoved into their brains the bra I can pretty sure that's it's not a whole lot um, just because of that uh, it's it's not the normal anatomy of how things work um, let's see here all right so your nasos uh, is indicated with patients with altered mental status, the ones that cannot tolerate an OPA. And the reason why we do OPAs is because they have a gag reflex. So here you go, like we talked about. Um, so contraindications, you have severe head injury with blood drainage from the nose. You don't want to use an NPA. Potential for a basal skull fracture. Potentially, again, I have to give you an idea that you may not want to use it, but you still need to secure an airway. You have to consider that and justify your reasons. And so if they've ever had broken noses, uh, that may be a problem that you may not be able to use it at all. And once you start meeting resistance, um, you wanna stop, you don't wanna keep pushing. You, you know, you, you could affect some things. It's the same thing when uh, we COVID test. Um, I've probably, unfortunately I can say I've probably COVID tested like three, 4,000 people, especially in the oil industry, we test everybody when they go offshore. So, and we're actually in the process, we test people before they come out offshore, and then once they get here, we test them again on day three and day seven. Um, it is kind of, it's two different types of tests, but uh, your nose gets pretty raw after a while. I mean, it, it sucks. So that's the best way to say it. But on here, if you meet any resistance, you just, you don't want to keep going. You want to stop, give, pick another nose. Secondly, it's, it's another nostril. All right. So back to what Victoria said, when you, um, you measure from the nip, from the nap, I'm gonna say that's tip of, Victoria, what are you trying to say? From the tip of the nose to the earlobe for an MPA. Correct, I can't read well. It's, so when you take a NPA, you go from the tip of the nose to the earlobe. Yes, it is curved, but you can lay it out. You can use them in the plastic bag and measure the distance. That is the basic way of telling you you're gonna be in the right spot. And when it talks about an NPA, uh, don't blame it on the iPad, girl. It's all right. I know you. So if you do the uh, the OPA, you're going to do from the corner of the mouth um, to the earlobe. Same thing. Same way. Same. We try to keep things simple. Um, it helps us out. All right. So now we're going to talk about delivering oxygen to people that are shortness of breath, hypoxia, uh, that just need some extra air. Uh, you can't provide that from outside, so you got to give it to them somehow. O2 cylinders, uh, you want to make sure that they are medical grade oxygen. Uh, and all the oxygen tanks that we should see out there are going to be this green and white. If you see any other types of green of oxygen that is not medical grade, um, it could be home oxygen that is still filled kind of the same way, but it's not regulated as well as the medical grade O2 that we get in. Same thing is from our, our uh, O2s on the trucks. Some companies can find full greens, but they're morally in the D cylinders, the small D cylinders. That's what you carry on the fire department and, and in the ambulance. Uh, check that the cylinder is labeled for medical oxygen and the month and the year that they're stamped. And this one right here, you can't really see it on this screen, but that's where it's stamped. Um, I've never really seen many that's been hydro dated. Uh, they have to be hydro dated to every 10 years. And after 10 years, they uh, if they can't be hydro dated again, they just they destroy the bottle and you you pay for new ones. Um, it's kind of a part built into your contract with your your companies. All right, so liquid oxygen, we're not really gonna mess with that. Oxygen that is cool to uh, everybody knows what liquid oxygen. You can always hear those horror stories. Oh, it's gonna freeze you. Uh, 
So thus, you have store large volumes of the oxygen. Containers do not need to be filled as often. Uh, safety concerns, ensure correct pressure regulator is firmly attached to the transport. Because if you're transporting these O2 bottles and the O2 tank's not on, you go to, I mean, the regulator's not on, you go to turn it on, you can have a big leak. Uh, you can actually, if there's some debris in there, can blow in your eyes or, you know, it, it creates this god awful noise. Um, puncture a hole in a tank can cause the cylinder to become a deadly missile. That's correct. You always want to secure the tanks when transport. It's a, it's a national traffic. It's a national safety standard act that requires them to be secured in either a, like the O2 bags or the cylinders themselves have to be strapped in. You know, so most of your ambulances, you'll see them in the little holders and they're strapped in. Uh, right, Victoria, you don't want to drop them. They, they could go. It's not common that they go boom. A lot of the times, if you knock the tip of the cylinder off, that they will shoot or they will scoot across the ground. So you have to take those in consideration. I've seen it happen twice in my career. It's, it scares you to death more than anything else. Um, so the pin indexing system. So your regulators fit into these pins. Somehow, whatever the company that you use, you got to find that out because there's certain... 99% of the time, they always fit. I want to say it's three and five because it has two tips on there. And then for the the, the seal and the everything to fit tight, and then you have the, the top clamp. They all fit in there the same way. I've never seen ones that have like the one through six pattern on there. They mainly just the three and three and five could be my numbers could be off. So. It says, again, each cylinder has a specific pattern. The ones that the big large cylinders that are in the ambulances and also in the hospital, they have the, the screws at the top. They don't really take a regulator like normal O2 bottles that we normally see. And there you go. It's the American Standard System for the large cylinders. Um, so what we want to do is we want to reduce the pressure because all of our tanks are filled up about i think that's 1500 psi uh so right there it says a two-stage regulator will reduce pressure first to 700 psi and then down to 40 to 70. Um, final attachments for the delivery gas you have your quick connect female fitting then a flow meter uh here look that's what they are right there so you have this is your flow meter right here that's in a hospital that's a quick connect and this is the one that's gonna that all of us are used to seeing if you've you've been in EMS before, fire service before, you, you've seen all these. You know how to change them out. You know how to put them on. Here's your um, your PSI per bottle. It tells you right there in a two-gauge two system. And then this one right here is the O2 that you're delivering. Um, uh, most of the time, all of them will go up to 25 PSI. I've never used that high. I've always used 15 um, as the max. Um, here's your... Uh, that's just your two different types. Your walls that you normally see, sometimes these are mounted in your ambulances, and these are also the ones that can go in the hospitals. Um, so right here it says you want to open the flow meter to the desired rate. Guys, we, we know how to do that. We know how to put people on oxygen. We've seen it. We've done it. You know, all well else fails. Chicago Fire does it. If they do it the right way, it must be done because it's on, it's on TV. It's done right then. Um, the biggest part that you can see right there, disconnect the tubing from the flow meter and turn off the cylinder valve when the therapy is complete. Because I'm going to tell you, if y'all have never done it or seen it done, when you move grandma from the ambulance to go into the hospital, somebody has forgot to unplug the nasal cannula. And it's going to look like somebody's trying to pull her mask off. So it's happened to everybody. If you haven't done it, just count. It, it's going to happen to you. Um, oxygen supports combustion because that's part of the fire tetrahedron. Y'all don't know that. Fuel, heat, and oxygen, you've got to have those things to create fire. So, careful for that. Um, oxygen toxicity. Yes, there is oxygen toxicity. We are probably 99.9% .9 of the time will not see that out in the field. Um, we're going to have that gone way before we see them, and we're not going to cause that. Um, guys, I see it's 8 o'clock. Um, I'll stop right there. We'll take a quick break. 
and see you in 10 minutes. Y'all have a quick questions or anything we want to hit before we get out of here for 10 minutes? I like it, Robin. Nah, I'm going to take a break. I feel you. I understand. All right. See y'all in 10 minutes, folks.
All right, folks, we're going to get back going. Um, roughly 50 or so more to go, and uh, maybe another 45 minutes to an hour. So hopefully we'll so. All right, so going over some oxygen delivery equipment. We got your non-rebreathers, your back valve mask, your nasal cannulas. Those are your simple ones. Uh, your non-rebreather mask. Uh, here, we'll just we'll just show you. I'm I'm a visual person, so the visual is going to work the best. There we go. So there's your non-rebreather. It's got a bag down here. You want to fill up. You want to make sure that it's completely fully inflated before you put it over the patient's face. Uh, contour the mask. There's a little nasal part right there. It's a little metal. You want to turn around and make sure that it's fitting and that you have it. I'm not gonna say thoroughly tight by the green strap, but you want to get it pretty tight. Uh, to where they can breathe all the air. If they're sucking the bag down to what you see right there, uh, you may need to increase it a little bit. And that's also a telltale sign that they're having issues um, with breathing, uh, maybe shortness of breath, maybe they're breathing too fast. Uh, so that's a telltale sign, on, especially on the non rebreather. Um, so here's your nasal cannula. Uh, same thing I showed you a minute ago on the uh, for the capnography. Uh, this is basically what's here. This but on the capnography had the little piece, if y'all remember, it went down like this. So I know, <laughs> Mac, you're right. It's never filled in the movies, the bag valve mask, but hey, they're breathing better than you can shake a stick at. But you know, they never use these or the simple face mask. They always use bag valve mask because it saves lives. So, you know, again, like I tell you guys, oxygen's cheap. Um, so put them on it. You know, the difference between this one uh, and the back valve mask is it just it delivers straight to the nostrils. So you're not getting the same concentration because the, I, I like to choose my delivery uh, mask by what the patient needs. If I think they need, you know, higher concentrations, I'm going to use the back valve mask. If I'm not uh, an elderly patient or they can't stand the back valve mask, I'm going to go with this one. It just works easier. Sometimes they may not tolerate either one of them and you just say, all right, well, you got to get one of them. If you don't want them both, then we'll just have to figure out what goes on. Um, on the next one here on the Venturi uh, mask, Venturi mask. Again, guys, I don't have a whole lot of uh, experience with these, but uh, it's, a, it's very similar to the uh, non-rebreather, but it doesn't have the one-way valve, so it, it can go in and out. If you notice right here, it has a lot of different attachments. Whoops, there it is, right in there. So that depends on your oxygen delivery. So it's kind of like this is what sets your your flow rate down here by the color. Um, a lot of services don't use these because they are expensive. And we as EMS providers tend to lose these. And that's basically how your whole device, your delivery system works. Um, delivers 24 to 40% oxygen. Uh, air is drawn into the flow of the oxygen and passes through a hole in the line. It, if you'll notice, I don't know if you can tell them here, but the holes are smaller. Big hole, big oxygen, little hole, little oxygen. That's the way I kind of put it. Um, so that's the part there. So trachostomy mask. Um, and so it's basically a mask that just covers the trach. Uh, you may have a device like this that holds it in place. Some people don't. They have a smaller one, so it's not as obvious. This one right here seems to be fresh because it's still got the four by fours on there or they made her up look like she's in the movies. Right, Mac? Um, so if you see, it looks like a simple face mask here. I mean, a bag valve mask. And this one might be because it's not a they actually have a contraption that actually straps around and fix that. That looks like a bag valve mask to me in this one. But you just got to deliver straight to the to the to the trach. Uh, Victoria, you can use a peed mask. That's correct. You can use that one. Um, but they do have these new contraptions out. They are trick mask. They deliver there. Um, so oxygen humidifiers. I've never used one in the truck. I've picked people up from the hospital and they're like, oh, they require to be on purified oxygen. Huh. Okay. I don't know where you want me to put that, but it ain't going on my O2 bottle. So that's going to be like your, you know, your, your long-term cares, your, uh, rehab centers stuff like that maybe have like your quadriplegics are going to have your the humidifiers on there all it is is sterile water uh that's really all it is it humidifies the air when it's blown into the body so that's big the big difference um 
Duh, number one. A patient who is not breathing needs artificial ventilation and 100% supplemental oxygen. I agree to that. I, I would like it too. So think about that. An irregular breathing pattern will also require artificial ventilations. Now, if they're, uh, they're having chain stokes like we showed earlier, we're going to want to try to keep them on a high flow O2. Uh, some of your treatment options look right there. You can have assisted ventilations. Talks about CPAP. That's a little bit higher than what we're going to go over, but a CPAP is not just necessarily what people sleep with at night, but we put them on in the trucks. I'm sure a lot of you guys are used to them. The only bad thing I'll tell you about CPAPs is they use a lot of oxygen. I'm going to say that again. A lot of oxygen. So if you put somebody on it in their home and you're waiting for about 10 or 15 minutes, let's say the fire guys, on an ambulance to show up, you're going to run out of oxygen. So consider that when you take, when you, when your medic starts talking about all that, make sure you have plenty of O2 bottles handy. Uh, it's going to be helpful in the long run. Um, assessing a patient with ventilations. So make sure that their O2 sats are going up. Place the mask over the patient's nose and mouth. Sometimes they're going to breathe in their nose or in their mouth and you want to create there. Uh, Bag mass ventilation. Squeeze the bag each time the patient. Okay, so maybe we're going. Um, hang on a second. I got I, maybe this slides out of order. So, not real sure about this one right here, where it says squeeze the bag each time the patients. I'm um, thinking more if they're talking about a BVM instead of a bag valve. Um, so after initially five to ten breaths, slowly adjust the rate. And deliver the appropriate tidal volume. I'll give you that one and, and adjust the rate. So if you set them on 15 and you get their breathing down and it's more controllable, you can adjust the O2 down to, you know, 12 or so. I wouldn't go any lower than 10. It's not going to be keep the bag filled up fully. So that may be something you have to keep in mind, but you can adjust it. Um, so air movement. So air is drawn into the lungs and goes round and round. Same thing as blood, but we want to, we can want to keep the blood in. We want to push you know, the O2 out, get rid of the CO2, and it helps things out there. Um, the air wall is not really affected during normal breathing unless you start having some big issues, unless you have, you know, penetrating trauma, something that you got to create a hold. You're going to overventilate them. Uh, it's going to create, you know, gastric distension, and that you're going to have a big old belly. Uh, sometimes you'll see that in cardiac arrest. Maybe the tube's not in the right place. Or if it is, maybe you say you as a new paramedic or as a new basic, you're ventilating too fast and you start to see that. Slow down, take a deep breath, you know, breathe yourself. That's important too. So got a little chart, uh, kind of gives you some ideas for positive pressure, um, but kind of a little deep there. So we'll go over to the mouth to mouth. <coughs> So it eliminates the risk of unknown communicable diseases and pathological barriers. I was going to tell you right now, Chris Wally ain't going to do that. Uh, now, unless it's my child or like my family member, we ain't doing no mouth to mouth. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, um, so I was a little, con Max saying, I was a little confused when you referred to the bag valve mass to a non rebreather displayed. Yes, they, um, let me go back, Mac. That's a good point. Um, so, right here. So, this is a non rebreather mask. Um, I think the slides threw it around. So, this is a non rebreather mask versus a bag valve mask. A bag valve mask is right there. So, I apologize. I may have said that wrong. But the bag valve mask, BVM versus a non rebreather, they are different. They do semi look similar if you think about it. Does have the reservoir right here. Uh, it is hooked up to supplemental O2. You don't always have to have supplemental O2 to initially start using this, but it's a very good idea to have it so you can inflate this bag. Um, I don't know many bags that are that big. Um, kind of looks like a, like a bagpipe bag that's right there that's kind of big. Mac, did that kind of answer your question, or did I uh, I need to go over it a little bit better? Cool. All right. I'm sorry. I'll take that one on me. So the bag valve, uh, the bag mask right here, so it's also called a BVM. You may hear it. Um, BVMs created initially by the company 
uh, that created it that way. Some several other thousands of companies now are doing this on their own. So they have created their different versions, but they're all basically considered bag valves. Um, if you look here, this is the nose cup. This goes on the bridge of the nose, around the bottom of the chin, and you hold it in a, basically it's called a, an EC position. Um, yeah, we're going to get to that. So, so there, can deliver as much volume as you want, squeeze of the bag, most effective when you use supply oxygen, like we just said, that's very important. Here's some of your components of it. Uh, we talked about the refilling bag, um, the outlet valve, the oxygen reservoir, which is the bag, and then you're going to hook it up to the O2 tank. Uh, so one way, let me show you the picture again. I tell you what, guys, I've got a picture I put in here. It'll break every single piece down. So I'm going to get to that picture and we'll show you. Um, here's the technique, and this is really on a, an adult. So you're going to hold as much larger volumes than you need because they have different sizes. They'll have the adult bag valve mask, and then they have the pediatric. That's the common two that you're going to see out there. Sometimes you'll see the, the child or adolescent, really, if it's you're just trying to get you to buy more because you can do both of them, the adult and ped, and consider it a good day. Um, so here's the two-person method. So a picture is going to be worth a thousand words, and it's coming up. Um, it's actually the next slide. So you kneel at the patient's head. You maintain the patient's neck in a hyperextended position. Um, there you go. There you go. Open the patient's mouth and suction as needed. And like we pointed earlier, you only suction on the way. Which way do you suction, in or out, guys? Right, Mac, we're going to suction on the way out. Perfect. Uh, so you're going to bring the lower jaw up to it. So if you notice right here, so the reason why we call this the EC method, see these fingers look like an E. It's making the E right here. And then this is a big C. And it's holding the mask on the bridge of the nose. And, at the, and here's the base of the chin. So that's the EC method. Uh, you may hear that. They may discuss it in uh, other ways, but that is the EC method. And I guess I talked fast. So look, there you go. If you're alone, you can use this method uh, and the EC method. So observe for gastric distension, like I told you about. Maybe you're ventilating too fast. Um, so you're not changing compliance of the bag. If the bag gets hard to, you know, to bag them, uh, maybe you're having some issues. You need to reposition the head. Um, so the uh, easy way to do this on a one person, um, kneel down at the patient's head. Use your knees on either side of the patient's head and go for that way. If you can also notice in this picture that there is a, a OPA in here, and that's a purple one. They do come in colors to kind of help you out. You know, you can use different colors for different things. Um, so here's what I was showing y'all. It breaks down the, the different parts of it. So a lot, of, a lot of the BVMs now are coming with peep valves. You can adjust the pressure. Um, most of the time they are set at a, at a normal 15 peep and that's set coming from the factory. Yeah, you can adjust it if you need to, but we don't ever really mess with it because that's the way it's set. Here's your face mask. They all come in different pieces. So your pop-off valve, what that does is prevents you from overventilating your patient. If you're bagging here and you're squeezing too fast, that excess pressure just peeps out, blows out because your peep is set. Um, here's your self-inflating bag. Reason why I tell you this, I actually had one of these questions many, many, many years ago uh, on my registry or of what part went where. Now, that's many years ago. So here's where your supplemental oxygen comes into. Told you your regulator valve. Guys, you're not really going to see these many, um, many of them. This is actually one from the ICU. And that's because it has different inlet and air valves. And if it's too much O2 coming in and blowing out, it'll, it'll pop out these one-way valves right here. Um, it's just easier for me to see it. Uh, no, hopefully when you go to your big, your hands-on portion, you better touch these, you bag them. You'll see the difference between the adult and the pediatric, and you'll be able to uh, understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about you. The best thing to do is kind of like put this part on your leg and squeeze the bag rapid uh, multiple times, and you'll actually feel the air blowing out this pop-off valve right here. It's kind of neat. It's one of those little tools. It's I'm full of useless knowledge, y'all, and I apologize for that. So here's your manually triggered ventilation device. 
Uh, you don't really see a lot of these anymore. These are all pneumatic operated. Um, I know, I think it's Birmingham, if I'm not mistaken, carry these. Um, all right, Mac, you say our BVMs are sweet. They have a light that flashes the rate. Man, bruh, where you work, Mac? That is awesome. Uh, what is it battery powered or is it uh, light powered? You got to give me some more information about that. I'm pausing, though. I got to figure out about that. I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, yeah, if you can, uh, maybe post that in the, the Facebook group. That'll kind of help some folks out. So that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, I'm sure it's not that cheap either, but it's very easy to help a, a member out. Um, so looking at this one, the triggered ventilation. I don't think it shows you a picture of here, but what this does, it fits around the bridge of the nose, just like the BVM cup. Um, so you can see it's hooked into your main O2 cylinder. It's got this contraption and this metal device. And there's a trigger. It looks like the big red button that you make the easy button. So you would push it on in inhalations. Um, and it gives them like this, this bump of, of, of high pressured air. Um, it's still a regular flow of O2 that comes through here. But you only would only pump this, uh, push the, the, I call it the easy button so we'll all understand. You only push the easy button on inspirations. Because if you hit it on expiration, you're just wasting O2. You're not really doing nothing to help the patient. Um, so there it is right there. So it says the, the demand valve is triggered by negative pressure generated by inhalation uh, and allows a single rescuer to use both hands to maintain a mass seal. Okay, I apologize. This one does it on its own. Uh, you can tell I'm talking old school because now I know what I, I, I was talking two different things. And then it'll reduce the, the rescuer fatigue associated with using the bag valve mask. All right. Um, I don't know many services around the area that have that. Uh, they would be nice and neat. Um, I can see it working on the, the triggering of the inspiration, and it'll make the device go off. Um, we're going to go over some, some vents real quick. Um, this is definitely out of y'all's league here on ventilators. They're becoming more and more and more and more and more handy on the streets. Um, one of the services I use, you work for, I currently work for, is we use them on cardiac arrest. Uh, we'll transport vent patients from hospital to hospital without having to take a respiratory therapist. Or sometimes we'll use them on long transports for in a nurse trip that paramedics can now do without having to be critical care. Some of your street medics, and you'll have to call a critical care medic in or a uh, critical care truck or a nurse to ride that. But they'll show your uh, your ventilator rates over here. You'll see your tidal volume. Your, that's your respiratory rate right there. See, they're breathing. They got 80 breaths. Uh, that's their heart rate. Their SATs are 98. Uh, their PEEP is set at, one, at 27. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on here, y'all. That is way over it. Um, I don't know why it's in here for y'all to see that, but so your wall, your ventilators, they have to be hooked up to a wall system. You can use them on a tank O2, but again, it's going to use a lot of air too. Um, this, all your tanks now automatically hook up to them that they, that's just something way that all the hosing, the, the tubing and the hose come from all these field ventilators that they use to go straight into there. Um, so most models have adjustments for respiratory rate and tidal volume. That's something that we can set as paramedics or that's preset by the orders or the respiratory therapist. They can tell us what they want to set out. Um, if the patient starts to uh, breathe over it, uh, the pressure relief valve is there. Um, so they have, you see that they, patients with poor compliance and it helps increase the airway resistance or there's obstruction, the, the pressure relief valve goes off and it'll change things up. Um, talk about CPAP for a little bit. Um, it pushes more oxygen across the alveolar membrane. They're very, very cool. It can help push the fluid out of the lungs, man. I, I love some CPAP, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of CPAP. It's, uh, they work really, really good. So, but as a, as going into the basics, into the EMS world, as I'm not real sure you're going to, you're, you're not going to be messing with this a lot. So I'm going to go against that and kind of move on forward. Um, so general guidelines, you need to let the patient know, hey, listen, you're going to get a lot of oxygen. You see this right here? 
you want to put it on less than 90. So what is the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? Victoria, unfortunately, that is a very long, that's that's a whole different, very good conversation. There's a very good choice, but shoot me a message after this and I can go into that with you. But that's it's, it's very deep I mean, going into that, especially for you guys. So here are some contraindications, uh, patients that are unresponsive, unable to speak or sit up, uh, the inability to protect their own airway. So you need to put CPAPs on some conscious patients. Uh, if they're in hypoventilation or hypotensive. So you want to make sure you don't use these on anything. If there's a pneumothorax, you definitely don't want to do that because we're just pushing air in and out of it. Chest trauma, we, we know we can automatically assume why we don't want to do that. And then if you have a closed head injury, worst case scenario, you can be blowing oxygen. Mac, I appreciate you posting that. Is that for the, uh, the bag valve mass that you're talking about, that link to? If anybody else wants to look at it that you're going to be on the recording later on, it is otwo.com forward slash ventilation dash timing dash lights. So that's what Mac was saying that their uh, back valve mask actually has a light. Uh, Mac says timing lights that can go on any BVM. Oh, okay. All right, cool, Mac. I'm going to have to look into that. Appreciate you posting that. Um, so there's contraindications, guys, of using CPAPs. Um, obviously, you can't use one if they have a trach, so that's against there. Uh, active gastro bleeding, nausea or vomiting, because you're blowing oxygen into them, and it's a high force of O2 blowing in there. So if they're vomiting, that's a mistake. That's gonna that's gonna have some force to it there, guys. It's gonna tell you it's, that's that's rough. Uh, the inner property to fit a CPAP, you can't get a good a seal on there. It's just not gonna work. If they're heavy facial hair, not like me, I, I I actually have used one of myself. It's just so I would understand. If they have some facial features that are just not going to create a seal, that's going to be a contraindication to be able to use that too. Um, here's the application of it. Uh, they're, they are powered by uh, O2. I don't know anything else that has a pump that creates O2 in there. Most of them have. Uh, they breathe out, they work off of outside air or forced air from the unit. Um, let's see here. Possible to cause pneumothermis results of burial trauma. That we won't see that in the field. Increased pressure in the chest cavity. So it, it will, it can do that. So because it's got so much pressure building up in the chest that's blowing in the O2, that they may, uh, you may start having gastro distension too. And as you can see, it's going to create the uh, pressure in the chest cavity. Um, the gastro distension, you'll see that signs of gastro distension. And this is something you also need to know when you're talking about bagging somebody. If you're rapidly bagging a patient, um, you'll see the diameter of the stomach's getting bigger. And you'll be like, bro, what's, what's going on? You'll notice it. I promise you, you you're going you're gonna to see it. Uh, distended abdomen, uh, it'll be a little bit more rigid. It'll be firm. Uh, it's like pushing down on your countertop versus pushing on your leg. You'll notice a big difference change. And then when you go to just bag them, you're, you're going to meet resistance. It's not an easy bag. It's not something that you're going to push. You're going to be like, wow, this I'm getting some getting some pushback, basically. Yeah, Mac, it's not good. Um, so... You can't use them for any of these either. Uh, if you've never messed with a stoma or trichostomy or, man, they just just be glad at this point in time. If you got a patient like that, be like, uh, I'm going to drop because it gets a little bit deeper into there, especially when you start suctioning on a stoma. Ooh, I can't. Even, that's on a stoma. You're going to limit to 10 seconds no matter what. Um, if I'm not mistaken uh, in your books. My mine says chapter eleven dash nine on your skill drill, but I think yours may be ten nine if y'all want to kind of look at the different steps and all that. But uh, on a stoma, just remember it's ten seconds on the way if you're suctioning that out. It's just a, is a memory. So here's a trichostomy that's placed. Um, mine's in the way. So basically, to be cut through here and all this will be flat against the skin. Um, Sometimes they're loose on here. I've actually seen them where they have a contraptions 
that's, that's surgically put into the skin that it'll snap into. But when they have something like that, that is that's permanent. Um, these they can come and go as as they age. Maybe they're having trouble. Um, so it's unfortunately we're seeing it more and more out in in the field that you see these. Some people have them that you don't even know it. Uh, then it tells you right here it's required a 15 to 22 millimeter adapter be compatible with ventilations. And you can also pull that off of uh, your ET tubes and then your capnography tubes. You can pull those off. A lot of times those will connect to each other. Uh, oh my God, the sound and color of suction. Uh, they're not, they not fun. And then remember, you got to clean all that up and put it in the right place. So don't ever take your gloves off. So right there, it's telling you ventilation is accomplished by attaching the back valve mask. To a 15 millimeter adapter so just remember if you happen to accidentally lose the piece that connects on there like i told y'all just remember in the back of your head you can pull it off of your et tubes that your paramedics stick down their throats or your uh, capnography will actually fit on there so it's about the same size sorry drinking some water there um so make sure that they, if you have any, I like that, dental appliances, if they have dentures, pull them out. Uh, you'll ask the family, hey, is there any, you know, is there any special arrangements with their having trouble with their teeth? You feel like their teeth have been moved? You can reach in there and pull those dentures out. That's basically what they're reminding you to do. Um, facial bleeding, uh, control it. Uh, apply direct pressure like anywhere else, as long as it's not in the airway. The face is going to bleed a lot. We talked about that already. You're going to have a lot of oozing, may I say. Um, and then you'll have some bright red blood, dark red blood. It is because it's very vascular up there. Um, when inserting any type of airway device, maintain an inline stabilization. So I like to, once I intubate somebody, put a king in or a, any type of OPA or something like that, I'll always apply a C collar. It's something I learned years and years ago and it's just stuck with me. It helps me keep my tube in place. The head doesn't roll around as much. I have something to secure it to. Um, tape really doesn't stick to the face a lot if they vomited. So they may help your medic. If you actually get stuck on the truck with a new medic and they just and they just start forgetting, just say, hey, what if we put a C-collar on them? It's fine. It's not going to hurt them. Um, King Airways, we're going to go over the King. I think the uh, LMA is in here too. So it's a latex, single use. We don't have to reuse it and give it to somebody else. You don't have to worry about cleaning them. So you can insert these blindly. Um, so without it blown up, you can see that um, the next slide has it. There you go. So you see there's, oh, here, let me get the right mouse. So this one will, if you go to their lungs, if this one can go to the esophagus. So it, fixes it so if you blow the tubes up and you're in the right hole so if you're this one goes down into the stomach let's say that way and you fill it up it closes it off and you're like oh i'm only hearing it out of this one so then it fixes it so you'll fill your your bag up it's great uh can be used as a rescue air device you have your king ltd and your king ltsd is the distant distal end is open distal end is closed they're really cool man i'm gonna tell you they 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 pretty neat um, but I'm still old fashioned. I, I love my uh, ET tube. So you look in here as an alternative to back valve mask when the rescue device is acquired or you just have a failed intubation. The paramedic just, you know, there's something that's wrong with their airway. It just doesn't work. Uh, contraindications. It does not protect the airway from effects of vomiting. So it will. It can create aspirations. So think about that, too. So with this king, it's it's temporary. Uh, you got to move fast so they can secure the airway with the tube. Uh, and it should not, and will you say this again, not be used with patients with a gag reflex. Uh, if they need to be sedated, that's that's different. That's way outside of your realm, but that'll help too. Uh, here's some compl uh, complications. Trauma, obviously. Uh, ventilation may be difficult. Uh, the balloon pushes against the epiglottis or over the glottic opening. It's going to be there. Uh, so the patient height and weight will determine the size. So we carry a king uh, four and five out here, and it actually you measure it by their weight. So uh, if you and we not gonna measure them. Can everybody hear me, Victoria? I know you said I'm cutting out. Um, 
I, I, I can't tell. I can't hear myself, but is everybody able to hear me or am I just having connection issues? All right. Mac, you got me. Victoria, I think you're just having Wi-Fi problems, girl. I think you have to work on that. I've been called worse besides Big Jumbled, but it's all right. I, I feel you, so I'm sorry. Um, so here's your LMAs. Um, so your LMAs are a little different, too. Uh, if you'll notice, it's just a V pattern right there. It's, a, it's, it's And it slides in. Guys, I don't have to tell you, it's a very simple device to put in there. Um, so opening of the LMA is right against the epiglottis, epiglottic opening. Doesn't really protect a whole lot. Here's some of your advantages. It does provide better oxygenation, but you're not going to cause as much trauma damage to the, to the vocal cord or the trachea wall. Or, and I want to say here's, it doesn't, there you go. It does not provide as much protection against aspiration as an endotracheal intubation or an ET tube. So uh, patient can't be intubated. This can be used separate uh, next to that. And so less effective in obese patients because they don't have much of a neck and it's you kind of need some neck space to work in there. Um, so here's some complications. Uh, so you can hyperventilate very easily because you don't. Y'all can see right here when I move my mouse that there's all you're doing is blowing this bag up. With this syringe. And that's it. That's all that's holding it in place. For some odd reason, it gets dislodged. It's coming right on up. Um, a lot of services are going to the eye gels um, for uh, as a basic. Uh, I've seen that come around a lot here lately. Um, they are color coded, and they it tells you your size. And I, and I want to say the eye gels are weight based. Um, you have to choose the right size. I do not know how to measure the eye gels because I've I've never really played with one. Um, Here's a, what's that, a Copra PLA. I've never used one of these guys. I don't know much about them. Superglottic device with the tube for ventilation, circumferential cuff proximal to the distal end. Looks kind of like a uh, King. It's probably a competitor. Or this right here will grow up. Mac, so the eye gels are about weight. Is that what you're saying? Cool. All right, thank you, Mac. I appreciate you putting that out there. Um, this is probably in a, in a competitor to a, an ET tube at a basic level. Uh, it's still got the ability here, if you'll notice, the ends right here to help keep it from getting blocked if there's some uh, debris in the airway or there's some vomit or anything like that to help block it out. Um, so recommend use for patients who are not at risk of vomiting. See, there we go. We found out what that was for. Contraindications are risk of aspiration or massive trauma to the oral cavity. That right there tells me I don't want to use it. I don't want to cause any more damage to somebody if I'm going to use this and it's going to create a, uh, especially some trauma to the oral cavity. So here's basically how you insert it. And once it gets to a point and it stops, and uh, if y'all will look right here, I'm sure there's probably a mark around in here that you would have to stop once you get to that mark. If you'll go back and look at this picture, it's wherever it sits at the teeth. I'm sure there's a mark line uh, that we just couldn't see. And you inflate the cuff and it holds it in place. And then you put your back valve mask, you start ventilating the patient. Um, here's a combi tube. Use these. Uh, matter of fact, I've used them a lot in Afghanistan and Iraq because it's very hard to intubate over there with just a regular ET tube. You can secure the airway better uh, to ventilate with a back valve mask. And here's how you do it. Um, so you'll inflate the tube, the little ring right down here. And you'll listen at the same time. You'll auscultate the lungs. And whichever one that you hear uh, lung sounds on, you're in the right place. You'll notice, see how this one's above and that one's below. Depends on which one you're, if you're in the right place or not. That's And then if you don't, you leave your bag hooked up on the right spot because you don't want to cause gastric uh, distension. All right, so some indications, airway management are of unresponsive apnea patients with no gag reflex. Um, if they're unconscious, sometimes a lot of the times the gag reflex is not going to be there. You don't want to use it on anybody 16 or younger. Uh, I'm 
I'm sure that's because you may cause some damage to the to the airway. Um, should be only used for patients five to seven feet in height. So an adult will get you there or a good, uh, I'd say start off with your junior seniors in high school. That's kind of an idea. I'll give you a rough estimate. Um, should be not be used on patients with known pathologic conditions of the esophagus. Well, we're not going to know that, are we? That is just a guess. Unless we go to a facility and they're like, hey, just going to let you know. But that's not going to that's not going to be our best bet out in the field because nobody's going to tell us that. Unless we get a really good history and the family happens to know that. Um, here's your complications. You, you have no unrecognized displacement in the esophagus, obviously. Laryngospasm, vomiting, and possible hyperventilation. And if they vomit, you're going to have uh, aspiration, and they'll have uh, foreign bodies in their lungs, and they'll come down with pneumonia, and potentially can pass later on down the road. Um, ventilations may be difficult if the pharyngeal balloon pushes against the epiglottis over the glottic opening. That's because it's closing it. It's uh, not providing any opening for it to get any air through there, so it's, you're going to have resistance in your bag. Um, there you go. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong screen. Um, so insertion, you want to check both cuffs before you insert them, hold it in, and they want to make sure they hold air. Once they hold air, you displace the air out of the, out of the uh, cuff, uh, put the patient's head in the neutral position. It's also can be called the sniffing position. Uh, you want to push the jaw forward, kind of like in a jaw thrust. You want to insert the device so it stops inflate the cuffs and you confirm the ventilation uh, is critical how are you going to guys tell me real quick how would you confirm the ventilation what's some of the ways that you can confirm that out in the field if your medic says hey i need you to do me a favor confirm that it's in place what are y'all going to do uh mac you can look at trust rise and fall that's correct but if you what happens if you see the stomach rise and fall, Mac? What are you going to do there? Uh, you Okay, James, you say adjust it. When you say adjust it, do you mean push it in further, pull it out? Uh, Mac, I'd not necessarily remove it. So, you know, let's look here. I'll go back. See how there's two different, see there's two different tubes? So you may be on the wrong one. So uh, now I was saying pull it out some. So that's some good answers. Again, we're talking about that on uh, mainly if I want to pull a little bit. Uh, if I'm ET tubes, so think about that. Victoria, so listen to the lungs. If you hear lungs, you're in right. If you hear it in the stomach, have the medic change tubes. So look, like she was saying right here, Mac and uh, James, y'all are talking. Y'all are in the right area, but think about changing. Especially on the combi tube, you want to just change tips because it's a combination of two tubes they've put together. One's probably going to go to the esophagus and one's going to go to the stomach. So there you go right there. So y'all are good places thinking about it there. Um, you're on the right track. I do believe that. Um, so you follow uh, inflation of the balloons begin to ventilate the patient and you confirm chest rise and presence of the breath sounds. So there you go. Like she said, confirm the breath sounds. I think you guys are on the right spot. What I was hoping I was looking for is just listen to the lung sounds. It's auscultation of the lung sounds. Tell me, do you hear them? Do you hear upper, lower, upper and lower lobes? It's going to tell you a lot of information. So foreign body that completely blocks the airway. You want to recognize it. Do, what, what's going on? Why are we not able to pull air in or out? There's like they're having trouble. So it says right here, attempts to remove the object manually could force the object further down their way. Correct. Well, we don't want to stick our fingers in there, so we're going to use like our McGill forceps, something into that matter, that we can, if, only if we can see it. If we can't see it, we're not going to blindly put our forceps down there and try to do it. If we can't get it, what's another thing that we can do in the field if the patient is conscious? <clears throat> Sorry, and able to, to stand, what can we do? Somebody take a guess for me. 
Correct. I was actually, you spelled that very correct. I was waiting for somebody to put it in there as a Heimlich, but that is the Heimlich maneuver. So hoping we can displace it by the Heimlich maneuver. So if we can do that, that would be the best thing we can do. And then now best bets are all there is that the patient starts breathing and they start doing these cool things and you're like, whoo, didn't have to do anything else. So if only if they're able, if they're conscious, you can do the Heimlich maneuver. So severe, severe signs of severe obstruction is suddenly an ability to speak or cough immediately after eating. It's the same thing you just said. Use the Heimlich maneuver. That's the reason why we want to try to teach CPR to your lay people. If a patient is found unresponsive and does not appear to be breathing, well, it looks like you're going to get to go to the gym and do CPR. You want to do high quality CPR for two minutes, get your chest impressions going. So. Listen, I know all of y'all are excited, but look at there. That is the end of the slideshow. I want to turn my camera on for just a second. Listen, guys, I, I know that's a lot, and I know there's there's a lot of into it. Um, the airway to me is really cool. It, it, it there's so much there that you can you can ET tubes, you can just learn all these different little tricks about it. But what I want to know is go back to your things, is that what questions do you guys have? Uh, I'm hoping later down the road that I can start to a little bit learn your the program that I'm using here that in the slideshows I'll add some YouTube videos and to make it more interactive. Um, I'm trying. Hopefully I'll go home and get a shave and look a little bit cleaner and eventually we can you know pick a random day maybe on a Thursday night of February we'll all do a video conference. We'll all join in here my video and we'll uh, pick each other's brains. I would like to hear some feedback from you guys and how to move forward into an assessment of the airway or a pediatric assessment. Um, I would like to see more. I'm going to try to use some more visual things. Uh, I know that it's harder to learn um, just sitting there and looking at this and slides. I, I get that. So I hope with some of the tools that I had out here that that was a little bit of ability to Give you some ideas of what to what the tools look like. I know that when y'all go to your sessions and you'll be doing hands-on part, um, that you're gonna see that. So, does anybody have any questions before we hang up for the evening? Um, I got your code over here on the side, but do y'all have any questions y'all want to discuss? Let's go over anything that you missed. Like Mac brought up a good point when we were going over it. I appreciate you doing that because I think somebody else may have had a, a confusion there that I met that I said wrong. So if y'all don't have any questions or anything like that, guys, I'm going to um, let you go for the evening after I put your code in the chat and then I'll say it out loud. Um, you're going to have to give me a little bit. I got to get the code to Rob so he can put it in there to assess everything so y'all have time to get credit for your class and all that. Um, if there's no questions, I'm going to start typing the code in there and I'll wait to see if there's any questions as I'm typing this in there. All right, guys, there's your code for the night. Your code is J7S11F. So that's John 7 Sierra 11 Frank. Everybody got that? All right, folks, listen, I appreciate your time. I hope y'all gathered something. Um, again, if y'all need anything, how important is capnography to an EMT basic? So, Mac, that's a good question. So if you're on a basic truck and you have the ability to use capnography, it lets you know if your patient's ventilated very correctly. Um, if your patient is getting enough oxygen, um, it, it gives you an idea to how to help, help you treat your, it's a tool in your tool bag. So if you have the ability to use that, that's awesome. So now you can know is the nasal cannula actually working for this little old lady because her O2 sats are up or does she need higher oxygen? Now, if they're in the 90s and you want their oxygen to be the 98 to 99, you may have to step that up. You may have to put them on a high flow O2 mask by nasal, I mean, a, a non rebreather versus the nasal cannula. That answer, did that give you a little bit of idea there, Mac?
Yeah, I mostly only see it during the cardiac arrest. Haven't seen it anywhere else. Um, Mac, I use it as a tool. I don't always rely on it, um, especially when I transport somebody. As I'm getting an initial set of vitals so I can build my baseline. Um, I put them on the finger probe or a kid. If they'll allow me to put it on their foot, that's great. So it's just a tool that will allow you to get your baseline of your patient. Um, it builds your, your history. It builds you an idea of what the patient is presenting as. And then you can just ask family, hey, are they, by chance, are they acting normal? Does everything seem to be okay? Um, be like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything. I just want to know if this is their normal baseline. Um, so if you happen to see it only on a cardiac arrest, uh, that may just be your, your company's procedures. Um, or that may just be when they just have to have signs of, uh, you know, good chest rise, you know, good capnography and, you know, good ventilation of a patient. How was that? Did that help you out a little bit there? Cool. I'm just curious. Uh, hey man, I appreciate the questions. Uh, like I said, Mac, I'm never going to turn down a question. I ask a lot and if I don't know it, I will definitely tell you. Uh, I don't know that. I will get back with you. I think that's very important. So, um, again, guys, if y'all have any questions that come up while y'all are looking at this, going over it, please post it on the, the Facebook page and uh, tag me in it. Uh, I got put in the group tonight, so I'll do whatever I can, and I'll add some some pretty cool things in there later on. Um, that's it, guys. I'm going to finish the night out, and I hope y'all have a, the rest of your good weekend, and y'all stay safe and I'll see y'all again on the first. All right, guys, y'all have a good night. See you later.